Hello and welcome to episode 7 of Learn with Aftar, the podcast that helps you become a learning machine. What you're about to hear is a conversation between myself and Yao Ousu Bohen. Yao is a Ghanaian-born American entrepreneur. He currently directs the Immerse Pre-Accelerator for Black, Indigenous and People of Color founders as the leader of the founder inclusion team at Bubble, a company which makes a no-code application building platform. Previously, Yao co-founded Lemons, which is an equal opportunity hiring platform for digital marketers. And before that, he was a consultant at the prestigious firm Bain and Company. Yao is a graduate of Princeton University with a degree in public policy and international relations. Now, what can you look forward to learning from my conversation with Yao? We talked for nearly two hours and covered a wide range of topics. We focused a lot on Yao's experience being an entrepreneur especially in the diversity and inclusion space and what differentiates that space from other sectors. And we talk about his time with Bubble and his journey founding Lemons, as well as his previous venture focused on the New York City nightclub scene. For all of his entrepreneurial endeavors, we tackle his biggest lessons and mistakes so that you can take that wisdom and apply it to your future endeavors. We chat about frameworks which helped Yao make the most of his corporate job and why he decided to leave it, which might be relevant for those of us who are working nine to five jobs, but plan to be entrepreneurs in the future. We also talk about the phenomenon of no code and how it can help you test your ideas faster, even if you know how to code. And throughout this episode, we share tips for budding entrepreneurs from things like how to choose a co-founder, how to find and approach investors, as well as how to distribute and find traction for your ideas and early stage products. Now, if you enjoy the Learn With Aftar podcast, be sure to subscribe on YouTube, review it with five stars on Apple Podcasts, or simply connect with me through my weekly newsletter. It's an email where you'll discover one thing that can change your life every week. You can find it at aftar.com. That's A-V-T-H-A-R.com. I hope you have a notebook ready or the notes app on your phone because you're going to need it for all the gems that Yao dropped in this two hour long episode. Please enjoy my conversation with the inclusive entrepreneur himself, Yao Ousu Bohan. Yao, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. I really appreciate you making time. I know you're super busy with the work that you're doing in the startup space. Uh, so thank you for coming on. Hey, no, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. I thought that we could start uh, just with a little bit about yourself before we move into the work that you're doing. Uh, I call the section Yao's Hero's Journey. So why don't you just tell our listeners, you know, where you grew up and a little bit uh, about yourself and, and what you're doing uh, today. Sure. So I was born in Ghana in Kumase, which is the capital of the Ashanti region of Ghana. I only mention this because a large part of my identity actually is the fact that I'm Ashanti and even less that I'm Ghanaian or African or Black, although my Black identity has really grown a lot recently. And so I lived there until I was about six years old. And then my family moved to the United States. We actually moved to North Jersey, where my dad worked in New York City, two days before 9-11 happened. And my dad walked the George Washington Bridge home that day, which was very like poignant, but my family decided to stay afterwards because they're, we could get into it more, but they're just very resilient people. And so we lived in New Jersey for basically my entire life, ended up moving down to Central Jersey to go to a better school district. And then when it was time to go to college, I ended up going to Princeton when I got there, I was actually pre-med because like most Ghanaian children, I was steered towards three or four options. It was doctor, lawyer, engineer. So three options. And I hated two of the three. So I said, fine, I'll be a doctor. Got to Princeton, took my first chemistry class and was like, this is absolutely not my calling. And I don't know what my calling is. So <laughs> I spent a couple of years floundering around trying to figure out what was interesting to me. But I'd always been interested in the idea of economic inequality and empowering people. And because I felt so strongly about my Ashanti and Ghanaian identity, it was most immediately felt in trying to tease out and figure out what the post-colonial period in Ghana meant for people and what does it actually mean to build equity there. And so first I was like, maybe I'll start some sort of healthcare system there. And I was like, that doesn't make sense. And then I got to read more about public policy and that started to interest me. I stumbled into what was then called the Woodrow Wilson School major. And so I majored in public policy there and international affairs focused on West African economic development, and then somehow ended up in a consulting internship my junior summer, which was with the U.S. government, 
as a contractor. And I basically was like, this contracting stuff isn't great, but I do find consulting interesting intellectually. So then I came back and was like, all right, I'm going to be a consultant and be a business person. I don't know how to do that, but we'll figure it out. And then ended up working at Bain when I graduated in large part because Bain was like the entrepreneur of the big three, or at least that's how it was sold. And then, so then I graduated in 2017. I worked at Bain for two years. I did six projects while I was there. It was really great for building up that intellectual foundation of how business works, building up that understanding of how to interface with people who are very senior. And it, it honestly showed me that I could do whatever I wanted. Like I came into Bain, like, oh my God, there's all these really big, important CEOs and executives and they do really great stuff. And I was working on projects with these people, sitting in the rooms with them, watching them do their work. And I was like, quite frankly, it's not that their work is easy. It's that it requires courage and intelligence, but I have courage and intelligence. So I think I can do this too. And I'll just fumble my way until I get really good at it. And so I ended up thinking, okay, how do I get there? What's the best path from, I was a consultant to big executive or someone running a company. And I was like, I should probably go check out startups and see what that's like. So I ended up leaving Bain two years in to work at a startup that was like a marketing as a service company. I did that for a few months and then got into this program run by Antler, which was basically like, <laughs> I, I explained it almost as a reality show because it was me and 99 other people who got accepted into the program. It was very you know exclusive. And the idea was we should pair up and start companies, pitch it to Antler, which was a VC. And then they would choose the companies they liked the best, give them some money and seed capital or pre-seed capital, and then help them raise follow-on rounds. So I was lucky enough to meet my partner, a co-founder, Christina, and we co-founded Lemons, pitched it, got the investment, worked on that company for about four months following. And then right about when COVID hit, our company was heavily recruiting based in hiring. And as everyone remembers, basically all of that collapsed <laughs> right when COVID hit. And so we took stock and we're like, where do we take the company from here? And I had different ideas than she did. So I decided to take a step back from the company and spent the early parts of the coronavirus experience basically in my apartment, figuring out what am I going to do with my life now? And what I realized was the things I always cared about, I came back to that same ethos of economic inequality and how much I care about that from college, from high school, and was like, I want to do diversity and inclusion type work within tech. I think that there's not nearly enough happening there. And I also think that startups and the tech industry are always our early adopters. And so new radical innovative ideas about how to do things will necessarily start there. And so I ended up in conversations with Emmanuel, who's co-CEO of Bubble, and we co-created this role that I'm doing now, which is founder inclusion on the growth team. And the idea is, how do we take Bubble, which is a platform that's meant to expand accessibility, help anybody be able to build whatever software product they want, and position it as a tool for inclusion, which it really is, and tell that story in an innovative way. And that honestly brings me to now, where I'm running the Immerse pre-accelerator, and also working on programming for next year. So that might have been a long-winded answer to your question, but <laughs> that's the that's story. amazing. No, I think we we have enough time to dig into uh, the various topics that you brought up. I, I'd love to yeah. learn more about your time as a founder. I know we've talked about this in like personal conversations about the lessons and stuff that you learned, but I'll, I want to dig into that later on. Uh, one point that you so I, I wrote down a bunch of things from the stuff that you said, but one yeah. thing that struck me is that you come across as someone with a lot of self-belief and a lot of conviction in your own abilities and the belief that you can actually make an impact in the world. I'm curious about, is this something that you've always had or is this something you've had to develop or is it something that maybe you got from your family or a family member or a mentor? How, have you always been this self-confident? No. Yeah. I, it was my gut just spat out no immediately. No, I was not. This happened probably most noticeably within the last year. What I will say is my parents did a really great job of nurturing my, I guess, academic pursuits. Their approaches were perhaps atypical <laughs> and a little bit As with many uh, African parents, I can attest to that. As with many that, African yeah. parents. But they, it was, I think I made the mistake as a young child of doing extremely well in school. And my parents saw that and were like, our kid can do anything. Therefore, we expect him to be able to do anything. And I think once I got used to that and was like, you know what? Maybe they're right. Like, maybe I can actually do anything. 
And so as I started to expand my horizons and try new things, especially when I was at Princeton, abandoned my entire life trajectory, and then just hopped into a new major, just tried it out and did well, and then hopped into a new career, tried it out, did well. Like I was maybe I'm actually the type of person who can pick things up and there is a big story unfolding here. But I think the real moment that did it for me was when I got into the Antler program, I was the, I think I was the third youngest person in the program because I was 24. They're like seasoned veteran in their forties people in this program. And they're all fantastic. And we all had the same task, which is build something that's worth investing in. And the fact that I and someone else managed to do that in like a 10 week period and get the investment, like I, I know it shouldn't have taken that external validation for me to feel that. But I think that was the moment where I was like, quite frankly, I can do anything I decide to really put my mind to. And probably more people than me also have that in them. They're just not as risk tolerant as I am. And so now the question I ask myself is, can I do that? The question I ask myself, is this thing I want to do worth the investment of time it will take for me to do it? Which is a totally different frame from how I've been living my life. But yeah, so this confidence, I would say it happened in the last year. I love it. No, I'm, I'm all for it. One thing, I, I, <laughs> yeah. so, something else that I want to dig into is, so yeah. you mentioned you were at Bain, which is a very prestigious consulting firm in, in the USA, one of the big yeah. three, as you mentioned. What went through your mind when you decided to actually leave Bain? Because I think as someone who went through Princeton, working at a company like Bain or McKinsey or Microsoft or Google is the pinnacle of the, the first job you can get out of college and is, is a wonderful career that many people are striving towards. And so I'm curious... One, you mentioned about the things that you've learned, but two, it's easy to get caught up in the kind of cycle of promotions and wanting to, once you're in the system, wanting to just move up the, the corporate ladder. I'm curious about what went through your mind when you noticed that, hey, this, is, this was a good experience. I'm grateful for it, but this is not where I see myself long-term. And how did you actually navigate that decision? Yeah, it was tough. I'm glad you asked this question because that was, I would say, the precipice of my quote-unquote quarter-life crisis. Everything that I was told about what life is supposed to be like for someone like me, someone who is a hardworking, ambitious person that goes to a prestigious Ivy League school, like what you're told is then you go work for, you know, Bain, McKinsey, BCG, maybe a bank, maybe one of the Facebook, one of those t software firms. You work your way up. Maybe you go get an MBA. You come back, you climb your way up the ranks and you build this great upper middle class life for yourself. And that's, I really thought that's what I wanted to do. And I went into Bain fully expecting that that's what it would happen. But I think there's always been this, I, I don't even know how to describe it, this like little piece of me that just knew that was never going to happen. And the reason I say this is because I wish I could be like, I got to Bain I did all the work there and I was like, okay, great. This is step one of 10 steps. It's time to move on. What actually happened was I tried my absolute hardest to be that person, to be the person who loves it. I'm just going to keep working within the system and keep getting promoted and moving up and love it. But it just didn't resonate with me within my spirit because I knew that although that was one path for me to get to where I wanted to, I could have stayed at Bain all the way through to partner and then decided to exit into a company and then make change I wanted to do. I knew within me I could do it now. And since I knew I could do it now, every day I wasn't doing something that I thought was really influential, like starting a company or like going to work on like another innovative company or I don't know, building something no one's ever seen before. Every day I woke up and didn't do that hurt me in a way that was like <laughs> almost spiritual. And that accumulation of just knowing day after day, I'm doing good work, but I could be doing a lot more, eventually just hit a critical pressure point where I was like, I have to just jump off and see if I can fly. And that moment hit about a year and a half to two years in. And I felt like, okay, let me just not be reckless and just leave immediately. Let me find a, a smart way to do that, transition my way out, build those relationships, keep them going. And I'm grateful that I did that because now I'm still in touch with a lot of the being friends that I made and mentors that I had there. But it was a really tough decision to make because I had to tell myself my brain and the logic and everything that people have told me is saying stay but my spirit and everything that is within who I feel like I am as a person is telling me that on the other side of the terror that is just creating your own life and career is something really beautiful and meaningful for me that will be fulfilling in a way that I can't even imagine now. And I just had to trust that part of my spirit over all the logic going on in my brain. And I'm really glad I did on the other end, but seriously, I was terrified when I made that decision. Wow, that's, that's a wonderful story just about listening to 
your own compass. One of the themes that I've written about and that we've chatted a little bit about on this podcast is this idea of being um, very aware and listening to your inner voice and, and trying to be your authentic self. And I think that story is an example of when you feel a certain sense of misalignment, not just letting that go and actually uh, tuning into that. And so I'm curious about one thing that I did actually want to talk about was the once you felt that I'm feeling a bit misaligned and I want to go with my gut, you were then very tactical about how you went about that. You didn't just quit your job the next day. And I think this is one of the things that a lot of people gloss over in, especially many founder stories where you hear mm-hmm. someone saying, I was at this company, I was unhappy. So I quit my job and I started you know, this company, but in reality, right. it didn't actually go that way. And you brought up this idea that you actually went about it such that you preserved a lot of your relationships and mentorships. So tactically, what advice would you have for someone based on your own experience who's feeling the same feelings that you felt there and actually want to leave the company that they're at to to see how they can do in the world, but to actually preserve those uh, bridges and not burn the bridges and preserve the relationships that they have? What would you say to someone like that? Yeah, no, I'm glad you asked this question. I think the thing I would say is to approach your career almost a scientist would approach solving a problem where it's not like you're trying to get to some perfect destination. What you're trying to do is build an overall narrative arc that is your career that is fulfilling to you. And so each stage, even if it's not perfect, has something to offer you that's going to pay dividends down the line. And it's about figuring out where you're at now. What are the pieces that are actually very great for me that I cherish and I value and I want to maintain? And what are the pieces of this that I don't actually need and I'm going to pull myself away from? And to to make it more concrete, I was at Bain, which is a company that we have client engagements (laughs) where if you're an analyst level, or I guess we call it an associate, most of what you're doing is building PowerPoint decks, running Excel models, and talking to people on your team and maybe talking to clients and trying to communicate those ideas. And I, I, it just doesn't sound very sexy. It's not very exciting. So I was like, if I want to go start a, a company, like why do I care about where my periods are on this PowerPoint or which icons are where? But what I started to realize is I was like, in this role, I'm actually getting very good at the skill of communication. The idea that I could speak to someone and sound confident and professional, even if I have no idea what I'm talking about, which was true more times than I would like to admit, is a skill that I will need down the line. So how do I put myself in situations while I'm here to expand on that skill? And once I started to reframe my job and not be like, I'm doing this because Bain is telling me to, I was like, I'm here because I want to get exceptional at communication. I want to get really good at like data analysis so I can do it for myself. And I want to build as big of a network as I possibly can, because when I leave, it'll, it will pay off. Changing that framing also just makes the day-to-day of the job easier. So that's the first thing I would recommend doing. The second thing is I would make an exit plan that indexes highest on the things you're trying to get. So what that looked like for me was once I knew I was going to leave, I was like, okay, I have maybe, you know, one or two cases left. So how can I make sure that the cases that I'm getting make sure that I practice as much communication as I can and I meet as many people as possible? And let me be very clear about that. Let me tell my mentor, I need these three things. Let me tell the person who's doing staffing, like, I need this. This is what I need for my career to work. And I'm going to fight really hard to make sure that happens for myself. I would recommend in whatever role you're at, speak to your manager and be very honest. Like I need for my career, these three skills, or I want to be in this position. What does it look like at this company for me to do that? And it's, it feels terrifying to do, but it's not, you're not like attacking them. You're not saying, I hate this place. You're saying, I've thought about myself and what I need and I'm being honest. And I really think that this is a company that cares about me. So can you help work with me? And you'll find that people will work with you because if you're doing well or even okay at the job, I know this because I used to run a recruiting company, replacing employees is extremely expensive. So they will go out of their way to make sure that you are happy and you'll stay. And so if you're creating and making it easy, like I want to do communication, I've seen that there's this case here, it has this and this, and I really think I would be great for it. You make the pitch, you do all the work for them, they're going to work with you. And so what you do is once you've created that last period of your job, which is oh, I've decided the next two cases will index on blah, blah, blah. Like it's all set up. The, the last thing I think I would recommend is to try to, I'm trying to frame this the way that I have a friend who said this extremely well, which is try to get as much immediate gratification for where you're trying to go as possible. 
So instead of being like, when I leave, I will get to do the stuff I find interesting, try to do it now. If you want to work at a startup and you are trying to learn what that is and you want to leave your company and go do that, instead of waiting until you leave and then going to find out, like, how can you be going to happy hours now? How can you be talking to people now? How can I like be listening to podcasts or how can I be just filling myself with the things that I find interesting, even in this space where I'm stuck, maybe at a job I don't love, because that's what's going to keep you going. And also it pays off because I decided to have informational interviews with people and go to happy hours and do that networking. When I left Bain, it was not hard for me to find my next job. And it also is a lot of the reason I got into the Antler program in the first place. One of my friends was there. I caught up with him because I was just like, let me catch up with my network. I find that exciting. And then that's, he told me about the application. He introduced me to somebody who was within the Antler program. And what do you know now I'm on the other side. So I I don't know how much I've ranted at this point, but (laughs) I hope that some parts of that are helpful. I guess the narrative, the summary is think of where you're at as step one on my many step journey and try to get out of it whatever you can, because there's always something to be gained out of any step. Be very clear and direct about what you need in this last period of the company that you're at and try to make sure you're enriching yourself with the parts of the next stage that excite you immediately, every single day, consistently. And I think that you'll be in a good spot to leave. (laughs) <laughs> That's such fantastic advice. Uh, there's a few things that I wanted to expand on because I think yeah. they're worth repeating. So the first one is this idea of wherever you are right now, looking at what can you learn right now in the position that you're in. There's a book that I'm reading right now called How to Get Rich by a person called Felix Dennis. So the, the title sounds a bit scammy, but uh, the content <laughs> is actually very interesting. And one of the points that he makes is that similar to Naval Ravikant, who wrote a tweet storm about how to get rich without getting lucky something that I've recommended multiple times in in the various writings that I've done and even on this podcast is you're never going to get rich working for yourself, but sometimes being an employee is actually beneficial to your career trajectory and getting you closer to where you want to go. The trick is you need to decide when working for someone else is going to help you learn the things that you need to learn in order to become the business founder or to become the CEO that you want to be. And so I think this idea of taking uh, taking charge of your own learning and your own growth curve is extremely important. It's something that's like implicit in, in the stuff that you're talking about. And I just think asking yourself that question, if you're unhappy in your job right now, focus on what you can learn now while making a contingency plan, an exit strategy. You can do those things simultaneously. You don't have to hate your job and then quit and then try and figure ask yourself, what can you do now? I also think it's a very practical approach because sometimes you need a paycheck, you got to pay the rent, you got to yeah. keep your, your finances going. Not everyone can just quit and have the savings to live off. Sometimes you got to make sacrifices. So I think it's a wonderfully practical answer. The second thing is something that I was actually chatting with a buddy of mine who works at a, a hedge fund here in New York City is this idea of your career goals versus the company's goals. Let me use two hands. Yes. So your career goal and, and the company's goals. And often I think people think that when they go and work for a company, uh, the magical thing that will happen where through the work that they're doing, they're just going to grow as a person. And Mm -hmm. often what happens is that you need to decide for yourself, Hey, how do I actually want to grow? What are the skills that I want to do? And I think if you're blessed to work under someone or to have a boss or a manager that actively mentors you and actively helps you grow, then uh, what you'll end up with is a case where your goals and the company goals are going to be aligned. And through achieving your goals, you'll actually further the company goals. But often what happens is that you end up in a situation where people are working on things where they're framing themselves as, okay, I've got to squeeze all the productivity out of myself to Mm -hmm. achieve the company goals. And I don't actually feel like I'm growing as an employee. And I'm blessed to be in a situation where, and just using my own life experience, at Timescale, where my manager is super supportive of the way that I'm growing and saying, look, how can we actually align these two? Because at the end of the day, you got to provide value and you got to, you know, show your worth and, and things at the company that you're at, but you also want to further your own goals. And so I think that, again, that alignment of how do you want to grow, taking charge of your career with how can you add value to the business and to the people around you, if you can find the intersection of those two and, and find a way to align, that'll actually make sure that one, you'll do well at your job and you, you'll be financially rewarded and things like that. But you also grow in the areas that you want to grow in such that you'll, it'll prepare you for being a founder or for your next move as you uh, start to take more responsibility or or try different things. The last thing I wanted to mention is this uh, quote that what you said reminded me of by one of the motivational speakers that I like called Les Brown. And he says, do what you can with what you have where you are. 
So it's basically this idea that like, you know, no matter how bad your situation is, there's always something you can do. As you mentioned, being proactive about what, you, what is it that you want to learn. You had those client engagements that you had to go on, but you said, hey, let me actually look at what can I actually gain from these things. These things that I quote unquote have to do now become these learning opportunities where it's okay. I only have two more cases left. Let me try and use these to further my communication skills or further this other skill that I'm interested in. And that reframing and changing your perspective of what exactly can you learn from the things that you quote unquote have to do and that you're obligated to do, that actually can be a, a total life changer because now you're no longer waking up, going to work and saying, ah, oh, I got to do this and I got to go to this meeting. But you're like, hey, this is an op- opportunity for me to learn. Let me go and take advantage of it. So I think that's a really fantastic advice. Thank you so much again for sharing it. Oh, definitely. I think something I tell a lot of my mentees that I don't think has circulated enough yet is that I think people forget why companies exist. Like, I really think that companies have done a good enough job marketing that we forget that the point of the company is profit, right? And modern companies came from the the industrial revolution where it's you are a cog in a machine and your job is to produce a product and you come in and you clock in and you clock out and you're measured on how much you produce. And at the end of the day, the company, are you sick? What's going on with you? It doesn't actually matter. It didn't matter then. We've evolved. We've gotten a lot more human centric. Companies care a little bit more about employees, but at the end of the day, you know, it's a contract. It's a deal. Like the company gets some value out of you. You also should get some value out of them because if you're a good enough commodity in the market of human capital, you can take your services somewhere else. And I think if you start to think of yourself more as a freelancer, which is like almost counterintuitive if you're a salary person, your work life will change dramatically because you'll understand that this is a negotiating table. And you always need to make sure you're getting what you need out of where you're at because that's what's most important. The company, if they decide tomorrow to make a strategic shift, can get rid of you and you'll be gone. They're not going to ask you how you feel about it. So you need to make sure (laughs) you're okay with that. Like in the same way you could leave. And so you just need to make sure as long as you're there, it's it's dating, right? Like I'm comfortable. I'm getting something out of this. They're getting something out of this. We mutually exchange my time and energy for them making some money. They pay me in return and there's a good deal happening there. But always remember that it's an exchange and it's a trade and it's a deal. And you are a person at the table. You have less power, but it's still important that you think that way. And the more, I, I think honestly, having that mindset shift is the foundation for everything else. Because once you start to realize that's what it is, you'll be like, oh, I do feel confident talking to my boss about this. I do feel confident being like, my career is, I don't know, 40 years. And I don't know how long I'm going to be here. But while I'm here, I want to make sure I get these three things. So yeah, I really appreciate that you hammered on that because I will preach forever that people need to stand up for themselves. <laughs> I love it. You know, there's this quote that you know what, no one is going to come and save you. You have to save yourself. And yeah. the same way is that like gone are the days where you would work at one company for uh, 30 or 40 years and then retire and then have a pension and stuff like that. Nowadays, especially in the tech industry, you're going to work at multiple companies over your time if you choose to stay an employee the, the whole time, which is there's nothing wrong with doing that. And so I think the, another, framing, another framework that I thought was interesting is this idea that when you choose to join a company, you should evaluate it as if you're an investor, because at the end of the day, you're yes. investing your most valuable commodity, which is your time. And then looking that instead of uh, necessarily the monetary return, which is an important factor, obviously, the equity that you're going to get, the salary that you're going to get, but also the non-monetary return, which is in terms of skills and growth and network and stuff like that. That's actually a very important thing as well that I think a lot of people don't don't take into account. Because remember when we were in college, we used to evaluate people's job offers and say, wow, your salary is this much and your bonus is this much. But what you don't take into account is, what are the intangible assets that you're gaining, which is who's going to be your boss and manager? How are you going to get mentorship from them? How are you going to learn from other people? How are you going to learn what it's like to be at a world-class company? These are the things that you should uh, take into account. You know, again, thanks for bringing all these things up. Oh, of course. I want to switch gears to your lessons from being a founder. And I want to start at one of the, so basically you've always been an entrepreneurial person from the time that I met you. One of the things, and you mentioned you're uh, from Ghana originally, we actually uh, first met each other, I think, working together at the African Students Association at Princeton. We were on the board of the student organization together. Yeah. And then after that, you uh, started this project called Wave, where you know we were texting one day and you're like, hey, I'm, I'm really interested in this thing. How can I do a project in this area? Can you tell us a little bit about Wave and your uh, interest in the New York club and nightlife scene? How was that? And, and what did you learn from that? 
Sure. Yeah. I'm so glad you asked this. I haven't spoken about this in ages. For context, I told you I graduated and then I moved to New York to work at Bain. And I love just as a general theme, I love bringing people together and having fun. Like it is probably one of the single most things I get the most joy out of. And so like most 22 somethings who moved to New York, I was going out all the time. And as I was going out all the time, I started to realize since I was new to the city and everybody else who was with me was new to the city, we just had no idea where to go. And so we would just get tricked into spending our money going different places and be like, that place sucked, that place sucked. Like, how do we know what's fun? I want to, if I think about my night as a time investment, I have four hours of my time to invest. How do I, <laughs> I sound like such a VC, how do I make sure I get the highest ROI out of where I'm spending my time? And I realized that like nothing existed to help me do that at all if you didn't already have pre-existing network connections. And I knew that there were hundreds of thousands of interns that flood New York City every single year, especially in the summer, who all go out and none of them know at all what to do with their time. And I knew this because I was going out with other people who were either interns or first year in college, and we all had the same confused gaze. But I knew the information was there because every single venue has a list of acts. They know exactly what's going to happen each week. And so I was like, this seems just like an inefficiency thing. If I can just get the right information to the right people, I think this is a really big match. And so I was like, okay, great. I was like, you're young, starry-eyed, first-time founder. Oh my God, I'm going to build this like incredible app. It's going to have live feeds of the clubs for people and they can check it out and know what's happening and they can share it with their friends. And it's going to be this huge social movement. I had no idea how to make this happen. And it's a large part of why I reached out to you because I was like, you've been a founder before, you did the thing. Like, I have this idea, I really want to do it, but what do I do next? And now that I have actually done the founder journey, I reflect on all of the missteps that I took in that moment. Like first I was thinking, okay, this is going to be a billion dollar company. What infrastructure do I need to set up now to make sure that's going to happen? So I was thinking like, oh, what about legal stuff? And what about this? And I can't tell people about my idea because they'll steal it from me. And I was like, man, can you sign an NDA? Because I want to make sure people aren't stealing my idea. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was an interesting experience. Just to, to jump in. Yeah. I remember you texted me about yes. this when I was about a year into building Afari and we were talking, mm -hmm. I was living in uh, Hoboken, New Jersey at the time. And so I was like, I didn't, I didn't have that experience of going out in New York City. So I was thinking about it as someone who doesn't go out, is this going to be interesting? Would I actually use this? And I remember you texted me and you're like, hey, I need you to sign an NDA before I can tell you about this. I think the yeah. first thing that I said to you is like, look, <laughs> just drop the NDA. Just like, tell me about it. Let's actually talk about it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to steal your idea. But I think one thing that was very interesting and I remember you learned very quickly about this idea of, okay, the, the proverbial MVP, how can you actually... Right. Uh, test out the idea very quickly without actually going through all the infrastructure and stuff like that. And at the time, I remember you settled on like an Instagram page because everyone yeah. is on Insta and like using it in an innovative way. Uh, I thought that was very smart and, and illustrative of the fact that you had this preconceptions of stuff that you were supposed to learn, uh, supposed to do, but then you learned very quickly and you're like, okay, let's do Instagram. Let's try and you know figure out how we can uh, use existing infrastructure to build uh, what we can in order to test this thing out. And in some ways, it foreshadows your work a little bit with Bubble, which is a no-code startup, yeah. which is how do you not write code and build what you want. But that's a topic that we're going to talk about later. Yeah. One other thing that I wanted to mention, and the original question is, what would you say you learned from doing Wave? What would be like the, the right. one or two biggest takeaways from uh, your first foray into starting uh, a company or uh, you know, building a, a product? Yeah. So I'm glad that you mentioned that point. I did end up pivoting to the, or not pivoting. I did end up trying to do the Instagram page as a way to test that out. I was like, oh, if I just have a bunch of friends each go and then post to a central Instagram that everyone else can see, that's similar to the app experience and it's free. So let me, let me try that as a way to test it. And I think what I learned a few things. The first thing is when you're a first time founder, I think you focus on all of the wrong things, or I focus on all of the wrong things. And I work with a lot of first-time founders now, and I also find that they tend to focus on a lot of the wrong things. We focus heavily on optics because that's most of what you So I thought about brand and design. I was like, I want a cool logo and I want a name that's catchy. And I want to have great promo videos and marketing. And that was where my head was at 90% of the time. I wasn't thinking about the most important things, which is, are there users who would be obsessed with this? And is there a mechanism by which I can distribute this quickly to meet as many of those people as possible? Like those are the two most important things. And I thought almost zero about them until we chatted and I started doing more research and started to understand that as a thing. And that is honestly a lot of why I ended up not going through with the idea and building out the whole infrastructure because I started to see that although I felt like there was a specific need for the solution that I'd found, 
the root cause of the problem that I was speaking about was actually a root cause problem of the entire events industry in general. And I wasn't the person with the knowledge to be able to solve that problem efficiently or adequately. Someone who is like deep, deep in the industry, maybe as a promoter has done it for years and years, maybe has the connections or relationships and industry experience to do that, but I wasn't that person. And I think that's another lesson I learned, which is just because you see a problem and you find it interesting, doesn't mean you're the person to solve it, which is another weird thing to sit with because I think I grew up, or at least most of what I had internalized was like, entrepreneurs are people who just, I spotted this thing here and I'm gonna go solve that problem. And there are some entrepreneurs who do that, but the, being an entrepreneur isn't like a one, two year investment. This is 10 years of your life that you're saying, I'm going to spend solving this one problem. If you're not the person who is best positioned to solve that problem, or if you're not willing to do the work to become that person, right? Maybe it's not worth solving that problem. Maybe that's not the problem you need to solve. And to keep yourself energized and going and working on it, you need to be that person. You need to wake up every day, eat, sleep, and breathe your customers. Eat, sleep, and breathe the problem you're discussing. And I saw that when I was trying to work on Wave and I woke up every day and I was trying to go talk to promoters to get them on the platform and go talk to people who are going to clubs and do user interviews and all this stuff. And I was like, this is so much work. This is so much work. I'm getting no money for this. And like, why do I care about this? And the way that you get over that is by already caring about it. Oh, of course I care about this. I would do this for free. I really care about this problem. Therefore, I'm the person to solve it. And so I think obviously the first thing I mentioned, just focusing too much on marketing and optics and not enough on actually solving the problem. And secondly, not assessing, I guess what we call founder product fit or founder problem fit were two of the biggest mistakes that I think I try to tell first time founders all the time now to think about, think more about the problem, think more about your target users think or customers think more about what they need, what are their actual wants, and do you care enough about them to just listen to them incessantly speak at you for years and years? Because if the answer is no, abandon it and find something you care more about. I think those are the biggest lessons, but also conversely, I learned that I could actually do the thing. Even though I, like I failed, I didn't end up creating Wave into an empire. That small foray into building it showed me that, honestly, entrepreneurship is a game that's learned with experience. It's really just, it's a way of thinking about the world and the way of thinking about business that gets easier and easier as you put in more reps. And I was like, if I just put in more reps and just keep trying to do this and keep just following the methodology and caring and investing my time and researching and talking to people, eventually I'm gonna stumble on something. And so maybe I wasn't born like a startup founder, but I can become a startup founder and this is something I can pursue, so. I love it. I think one thing that you mentioned that is, again, worth repeating is Mm -hmm. this idea that when you have a startup idea, the lean startup methodology has become the kind of the de facto playbook for people starting companies today. You want to test your idea. You want to have an hypothesis and see uh, if you can find some sort of uh, information to validate your test. But I think more importantly, it's not just about validating that the problem exists. It's also validating and testing. Is this something that you actually want to spend your time on? Because I think, as you mentioned, startups are a five to seven to 10 year endeavor if everything goes well. And you need to ask yourself, is this the problem? And is this the audience that I actually want to spend the next 10 years of my life to serve? And if the answer to that question is maybe or uh, I'm not sure, then you probably, one, your startup is probably not going to succeed because I think that you need to be customer obsessed. You need to be really obsessive and have deep empathy for your customers. And that's how you're actually going to build the right product. Paul Graham has this idea that if you focus on the customer's problem, the not Paul Graham, I think it's a market recent. If you focus Mm -hmm. on the customer's problem, the the right product actually gets pulled out of the market. If you pick the market that you're actually passionate about and that you actually want to serve. Mm -hmm. But then secondly, the idea that you mentioned about, I call it product market founder fit or founder problem Mm -hmm. fit. I think it's Mm -hmm. so important. I'm really glad that you brought it up because this, uh, this idea that I remember when we, even when we were talking, we were having, uh, I think we were at like a taco place uh, on the east side in New York City. And you were telling me all of these startup ideas. And I was like, this sounds like an interesting idea, but are you the person to do this? Is this something that you actually want to do? I think when people approach the the idea of ideating about a business, they think about like, what are possible businesses that could be started versus what am I actually passionate about? And how can I figure out a problem that I can solve? that or a uh, market that needs me or an audience that needs what I can provide and the knowledge that I have and things. And obviously that's a scary question because as people, 
uh, we often doubt ourselves and say, I'm just little old me. I'm, I don't have that much mm-hmm. experience. I'm not Elon Musk or something like that. What can I actually do? And I think the process of overcoming that self-doubt and actually figuring out, hey, this is actually a market or this is actually a problem that I, I do have a lot of experience about. And I am, as you said, willing to overcome the inadequacy or the uh, places that I don't actually know about. And I'm actually willing to confront them and going to learn about it because this is right. a problem that's very important and, and worthy of me pursuing. That's such an important point because at the end of the day, you're never going to be, or it might not feel like you're the right person to do it. But I think being willing to learn and being willing to say, hey, I might not know everything right now, but I'm willing to actually investigate and go in and learn and go and talk to people to gain those kinds of skills such that we can solve this problem as the problem is so important to you. So I thought that was really fantastic. This whole idea of product market founder fit or founder problem fit, as, as you said, something that I think people should pay a lot of attention to. And the other thing is, so on, on, on that topic, there's a, a venture capitalist that I had the pleasure of meeting while I was doing Afari. His name is Nikhil Basu Trivedi, also a Princeton alum. You might've met him actually. And one thing that he says is that a question that he looks at when he evaluates startup founders is how is this startup the result of your life's work so far? So when you look at, say, for example, someone who is doing, I'm just going to make up like a medical technology startup. Maybe they spend some time with a doctor. Maybe they spend some time in an adjacent space that they learn something that could actually inform a unique insight for like why they want to do this company. Because I think at least being able to answer and to convince someone else that, hey, I'm actually the right person to do this. And I think the first person you need to convince is yourself because that actually gives you that conviction and that self-belief. And the last point that you mentioned about when things feel like work, you mentioned that you would go and speak to these I think it was club owners and, and promoters mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And when it starts to feel like work, that's actually an indicator that, hey, I might not actually have the passion that I thought I did to do this. Because right. if it's something that you're a problem that you care a lot about, then the steps, you know, might, while they might be mundane and stuff like that, you feel that the overall goal is actually worthy of uh, sacrificing the, uh, the difficult conversations or maybe some of the boring stuff to actually achieve that. Those are, I'm really glad you brought up all of those things. Yeah, no, I, I mean, that's so real. And I think, I know we'll get to this later, but I contrast that to how I feel about a lot of the mundane things I do to make immerse work, which is a lot of mundane stuff and juggling. So for, for context, immerse oh, yes. is the accelerator that you're working on, right? Yes, yeah. Um, it's a lot of work. And there are days where I spend all day just talking to people or doing logistics stuff that I, in my personal life, would find absolutely just <laughs> abhorrent. But I take, there's like a joy to me doing it because I care deeply about these founders. I care deeply about the idea of creating a pathway for first time founders of color to actually get plugged into the ecosystem. I care so much about this that I am willing to devote my personal time. I'm willing to hop on the phone in the middle of the night to talk to someone about their company and they don't know what's happening with it. What do I do now? I'll do it. Like I will do what it takes because I really care. And now that I'm there, I like look back at all the ideas I came up with. It's funny that you brought up how I gave you this kind of list of ideas. For those who don't know me, which is probably most people, before I ended up in this place that I'm at now, I had a Google Drive folder and it was just called ideas. And at least once a month, I would think of some great scheme. Oh, I've read this thing and I saw this thing here and there's not enough, blah, blah, blah. I think that a company that does this will be incredible. And I would spend weeks doing market research and talking to people. And almost every time I'd be like, ah, at the end of the day, this is a bad idea. The reason I chose Wave was one of those ideas. And the reason I went through with it was because I felt like I had enough traction to be like, let me pursue that idea. But I look back on that approach and I'm just like, like I eventually chose the one I thought was the most promising and it ended up being extremely energy draining because it wasn't a good founder problem fit. Whereas now, it, as I'm getting a little bit more understanding of what actually dr- makes me tick and what I care about, being on the other end, there's always going to be mundane stuff. There's always going to be days where you're like, why am I spending my time doing this nonsense? But if you can sit with yourself at the end of the day and be like, this is fulfilling. I find this valuable. I think it's worth it for the people I'm serving. That's how you know you're in the right spot. I love it. I want to touch a little bit on your biggest, I guess, the the startup that you had the most uh, traction with or the most um, success with, which was Lemons, LMNS, yeah. before we dig into the diversity and inclusion in tech, because that's something I want to spend time on as well. But I guess with Lemons, you described it as a ability first 
equal opportunity hiring platform for digital marketers. So I'm curious about what you learned about the hiring space. Uh, and then we can get into some of the things that you learned in terms of lessons and mistakes and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. could you just describe what the company did and, and the problem that you guys were trying to solve? Sure. So there were a few problems we were trying to solve, which was part of a lot of the reason that we didn't end up being as successful as we wanted. But it started off with this idea that Christina and I just thought it was patently ridiculous that you were more likely to get hired for a job if you could demonstrate that you did a mediocre job at 10 companies than you were if you could demonstrate that you could right now do an exceptional job. Our hiring market is structured to value experience and big name companies over actual ability to execute. And what that mismatch does, because there's systemic discrimination that prevents people of color, women, people of uh, backgrounds where they didn't have as much access to capital in all forms, it basically excludes them because they don't get into the first step of the funnel that gets you into Princeton and then into Bain and then into whatever so people can look at you and think you're smart, right? There are lots of people just as smart, smarter than me who just didn't get into Princeton and so they're not as privileged in the same position as me and I'll get hired before them even though they would do a better job. Christina and I thought that was ludicrous. It made no sense. And so we were like, where is the pipeline or pathway for people who don't have that privilege to get those same opportunities? And so we ideated, well, what could that look like? And what we saw was technologies advanced to the point where we can actually measure productivity on a level that is much, much more granular and specific than we ever could before. If you are a digital marketer, we chose digital marketing because we thought of the arts fields, it was the one that was the most technical. If you're a digital marketer and I hire you to get me leads on my landing page, I'll know if you're doing a good job. Like I'm hiring you to get me 10,000 leads. If you don't get me those 10,000 leads, okay, maybe you weren't the right hire as opposed to many jobs where it's amorphous and it's hard to tell. And so what we were thinking was how do we take that data-driven approach and just apply it to anyone instead of limiting that take-home exam to tell how good you are to just the people who made it through your application process. What if literally anybody anywhere could participate in a challenge to show that, hey, I'm actually a brilliant digital marketer. Look what I did for you. Please hire me through that pathway. And that out of that birthed Lemons, which was supposed to be this platform where we could basically create competitions that could assess how good a person could be at a job, no matter where they came from, regardless of their resume, and then give you confidence as an employer to be like, you know what? This person went to a school I've never heard of, and they have zero actual digital marketing experience, but they taught themselves and look how well they did on the lemons challenge, I'm going to hire them. That was the birth of the company. As far as what I learned about the hiring space, so much. Let's see. The first thing I learned about the hiring space is it is an extremely saturated software market. There are, within New York alone, at least 500 companies that have software products that are meant to make your hiring process more efficient or more fair or easier for you or more equitable at least, and I say 500 because I read through the sheet list in New York City of every single other company. So very saturated market. The second thing I learned was the thing that drives purchasing within that industry isn't what you would expect. People aren't, as a hiring manager, right? You're not necessarily looking to have someone come tell you how biased you are in the way that you're hiring. That's not what you're looking for. You're trying to make sure that the investment you make in the person that you hire is not going to come back to bite you in the butt with your boss or with yourself. That's what drives hiring. I want to choose a person who's going to do a good enough job that I don't have to take crap from the people above me or myself. That's what drives hiring. It's not like I'm so excited to get this person. It's I am overwhelmed with this work that needs to happen. And I just want to find someone to take it off of my plate and not give me problems. And if you start to understand that, it actually changes completely the types of products that you'll want to build to solve that need. We were building it to solve almost like a nonprofit y do good need and less like a human person in an organization trying to make a decision need. And I think the th- third thing I learned about hiring is that it's an imperfect science and a lot of people are very okay with that. If you were to ask, I, I, I would wager if you did a survey of 100 hiring managers, and you ask them, how good is your hiring system at choosing the best talent? The vast majority would say, we're great at choosing the best talent. If you were to do an objective analysis with double-blinded studies and like a control group, you'd probably find that you could flip a coin and make as good a decision as any hiring manager. And so (laughs) the problem isn't even clear to the target customer that you're trying to reach. And that disconnect, I think, is why there's 500 HR software companies in New York, because 
everyone thinks they can solve this problem. It's so obvious. It's so intuitive. Obviously, people don't always make good hiring decisions. We all know this. How to solve that is so intense because it gets at psychology of people hiring. It gets at systemic biases and people applying for the jobs. It gets at inefficiencies and in trying to make that happen. It gets at like how tough it is emotionally to invest your energy. And so it's just a really tough, nuance and complex issue that gets at so many different other issues. And you have to really be intellectually curious about just investigating every single facet of that if you want to dare step into this huge saturated market. Have I disincentivized you from joining the HR space yet? <laughs> I think it's actually very interesting. I'm, I'm interested in the talent space in general because yeah. I worked at a company called Andela. They're also, they have an office in New York, but they're a, a global company with presence in uh, Rwanda and Kenya and um, Nigeria, as well as one or two other African countries. And they're also right. trying to do something on the talent space, not necessarily the, the hiring mechanism space. But right. yeah, I just think it's interesting when you think about talent and hiring but how can you actually, one, make the process more fair, but also mm-hmm. two, make people aware that like a problem exists? Because I think as a founder, sometimes yeah. you, you realize that I have a fire that I'm trying to put out and I need to get someone to do this. I'm okay with not necessarily hiring the best possible person as long as I can make this problem go away. It's like the good enough uh, fit where it's like, okay, this person is good enough and uh, you know, we'll make it work in this case. And so I found it so interesting about one of the takeaways that you said is to get the target customer to understand their problem and they're not actually aware that this is a problem that they're having. And I think in the B2B space, one of the things that you, at least uh, I've seen in the software space that a lot of companies spend time on is making sure that what you're solving is like a burning problem for the customer. Michael yeah. Siebel, the CEO of Y Combinator says that you want to look for those problems where the customer's hair is on fire. This is a problem where it's, okay, if we don't have this thing, it's going to make our life so much worse. And like our engineer productivity is going down. And if we do have it, it's going to make sure that we can spend all this time on other stuff and, and life is going to be great. And I don't have this, uh, my hair is not on fire anymore. I can cool <laughs> down and breathe easy. And I think that's such a, it's yeah. such a really insightful point that while a problem may exist, it might not be a hair on fire kind of problem that companies are willing to throw money on and say, hey, I can't actually run my business without this thing. Um, Mm -hmm. So here's my money and I'm going to pay for it. And I think the fact that there's 500 companies tells me that, or 500 companies in New York focusing on on hiring tells me that there's a problem in the market, but no solution and no, no one company has actually solved the problem in a meaningful enough way, such that problem is present at a variety of, of different companies. So it's actually very interesting. I don't plan on going to the hiring uh, space anytime soon, but it's it's interesting to learn about it from someone who's actually been in it. On the topic of things that you've learned, I'm curious about Mm -hmm. the mistakes that you made and uh, the lessons that you learned from them while doing Lemons. Uh, If you could chat a little bit about that, obviously feel free to uh, leave out things you don't necessarily want to mention, but in in an intellectual uh, sense Mm -hmm. and as being a founder and also being a person, Mm -hmm. a human being, what were some of the mistakes that you made and, and what did you learn from them through your time as a founder of Lemons? Yeah, mistakes I made. How much time do you have? <laughs> Let's see. I, I think, I guess I'll start with topics because that's the way that my brain thinks about it. The first thing I'll think about is the idea of finding a co-founder to solve a problem with, which is crucial. Most companies now are founded by more than one person. And so if you're a person working on an issue or a problem you find exciting or you're passionate about, eventually you're going to have to bring someone in to share the load because it's just too much work to do by yourself. I had approached that from the perspective of who is another person that finds this same thing, the same problem, intellectually interesting. And we'll just care because we both just care about this problem. I hadn't thought about, I guess, the softer things like what are your value systems? How do you perceive the world? Like, how do you interact with strangers? Like just questions about how humans move through space. I didn't really think about that as important as I was trying to find this uh, partner because when you're doing a job interview, they don't typically ask you those questions. It's usually, can you do this job? Do you want to do this job? Are you capable of doing this job? Fantastic. Come do this job. I think I learned from this process that it's choosing a business partner is very different from choosing an employee because 
you are choosing a person who you're going to go on the most traumatic and emotional journey you could possibly go on. And I'm not just seeking this from my own personal experience. Talk to any entrepreneur who will be honest with you. It is I, I can confirm. It's very, very That's true. That's what I'm saying. It is hard. You, there are really bad days. You're going to be really stressed out. People are going to tell you you're stupid for wasting your time on whatever it is you're doing. And the question you need to ask yourself is, who do I want sitting next to me? when I'm going through that problem. And I hadn't thought about that initially because a lot of the process of working on Lemons with Christina showed both of us like, oh snap, like, we just maybe aren't the person who we need to be sitting next to and that's okay, but we should have thought about that earlier. And so I know that now. So I think that was one of the biggest lessons that I learned about company formation and surrounding yourself with people because it's not just about, do you care about the problem? It's about, do you really vibe as people? Do you connect on a deep enough level that you can go through hell or high water and still come out on top? So I think that was one lesson I learned. A second lesson I learned is entrepreneurship is not sexy and that is the way it's supposed to be. And I think as this shiny Princeton grad Bain consultant, I like came to entrepreneurship. This will be great. I'll sit on my computer. I'll send some emails. I'll write be some on the posts. beach. <laughs> yeah, I'll be, you know, it'll be, it'll be cool. Maybe I'll go to some networking events and stuff. Like at the end of the day, like how I got my first deal I just scrapped, I like almost snuck into a marketing convention because I like found out about it online and it was happened to be near me. So I just showed up and then just talked to 50 people, 49 of whom were like, please go away from me until I found the 50th person <laughs> who was willing to speak to me. And then I had more meetings with them. And then I, they told me about a networking event that I then went to. And it was like, for for reference, like I just didn't, this was all out of my comfort zone. I did not want to leave my computer, but I learned if I ever wanted this to get off the ground, I was going to have to do a bunch of this dirty, sad, depressing work where people just constantly tell you no, and you have to just be okay with it and keep going. That that's what it takes, especially in the early stages to get something off the ground. All you hear from entrepreneurs is once things are working, you never hear about the dozens of no's they get and all the hard days, but that's a necessary part of the journey. And it has to happen and you have to be okay with that. So I think that's the second lesson I learned. And I think the final lesson I learned was just how important, and I don't know what the specific word is for this, but it's a mix between optics and networking, raising money. And maybe this is a whole other topic, but yeah. I had perceived it as like, I want to do this thing. Look how great this thing could be. Please give me money so I can go do this thing. What I've since learned is it's, I have found this incredible thing and I've built this even more incredible thing to solve that thing. And I'm already doing it. I don't need y'all, but if you're interested, sure, I'll take a meeting with you. That's what fundraising is, yeah. right? It's building FOMO. It's like looking like you don't need them. And a lot of it is that optics and networking and looking cool and building the right image and brand for yourself and negotiating between different partners and building hype and like all of that piece of it. I just didn't know any of that until I got into the space. And so I think once I learned that also, it changes your perspective because I think that in the beginning, I came off a lot like a beggar where I basically just lowered my status from the beginning because I show up and admit that I'm someone who needs something. And, and, and I wish I could go back and like approach things more from a position of power, be more self-confident. Like I'm actually a great exceptional person. I am working on something interesting and all those other dudes over there, especially people who are more privileged than me and are naturally more confident <laughs> are over there talking all this hype. And I also have good stuff, but I'm not talking about any of that. And I think that's something I've also seen is exacerbated the less privileged you are in society. If you are a black female queer founder, your whole life you've been told that you're not anything and that you don't have things to offer. So you don't approach with as much confidence, but confidence is what really reads and propagates in the ecosystem. So you're setting yourself up for failure almost. So conversely, it, you have to just be like, it's, it's almost fake until you make it, but it's more just empower yourself because you actually are that good because you wouldn't be where you're at if you hadn't earned it. So just lead with that. Be like, yeah, I am here. I do deserve to be here. I, I am doing something incredible. I am, I deserve to be in this room. I deserve to be at this table. I and mean, I think that's another lesson I learned too, because they're not going to tell you to be confident. You have to tell yourself to be confident so that they can read confidence from you so that you can get doors open for yourself. 100%. I think those are three really fantastic lessons. I want to chat a little bit about the last one that you mentioned, this idea about optics and confidence and, and mm -hmm. raising money from investors. During my time as a founder, I realized there's two kinds of investors. There's conviction investors and the sheep investors. This is at the very early stage, like your seed, maybe even series A. 
Right. The conviction investors are those who will listen to you and basically your job is to teach them about this, this I'm trying to not use a, a mathematical term like um, in asymmetry or something, but basically this mm-hmm. opportunity that exists in the world that no one else saw that you happen to come across and you are now saying that, hey, this is a problem that's worth solving. Look at the solution that I built. I need some investment in order to go and capture the full potential in this opportunity. So you're saying like, hey, this is something, this is a journey that I want you along for the ride. Mm -hmm. And the conviction investors will analyze that and and understand, is this a good enough opportunity? And if they believe in you, and if you can basically put yourself across such that you're someone that's worth believing in to someone that you don't know, then, then these people will invest in you. And I think one of the strategies that I advise founders is to look for investors that look like you or have been through similar life journeys. It's the reason why the old boys club of Silicon Valley works because most of the investors are white and they're going to get into this in the diversity and inclusion part next. And most of the founders are white dudes coming out of of CS programs and stuff is, Hey, anyone with a hoodie and a laptop, you're cool. Let me go and fund you. But you can actually use that to your advantage now, especially with a lot of funds and investors focusing on diversity and inclusion, but also just funds and investors who may be investors of color or people who came from the same country as you, who went through the same kind of experiences. If you're an immigrant into a country, go and look at the investors who have been immigrants because they can actually empathize with your story and say, hey, this kind of reminds me of me when I went through that experience. You're more likely to find conviction investors from people who resonate with your life story and, and the journey that you've come on if they've had similar uh, experiences to you. So for example, in Afari, one of our uh, greatest advisors was someone who was from Africa, who was an investor based in the USA. And he had a very similar journey to myself and, and one of my co-founders where left home to go to an, an international school, then came to Princeton and, and so, so things like that. But I think that you don't have to have the privilege of being associated with certain institutions. I think that helps definitely if you can find other like Harvard and Princeton alums who went to your high school in New Jersey and stuff like that, that definitely helps. Yeah. But it doesn't have to be like that. You can find someone if you're from a certain area in California or Chicago, or for my listeners in South Africa, if you're from a certain area in Durban or Cape Town, you can find other people who are there and say, hey, you know, this is where I'm from. Oh yeah, I know this thing. What school did you go to? Okay, cool. That's how you build rapport. And that's how they come to invest in you as a person. And you're not going there to say, hey, I need this money. Can you, um, I have a cup that I need to be filled versus, exactly. hey, I've already done this thing. Look at me as a person. Look how much I've overcome in life. This mm-hmm. is an opportunity and this is something that I'm offering you to be a part of. And then there's a the sheep investors. I could rant about sheep investors also. <laughs> Please open the box. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. Basically, these are people who are your classic investors who they, the first question is who else is investing? They don't have conviction about these things. They basically look at what's trendy. These are the kinds of people who you're not going to, if they can't make a decision independently, they often give you like these reasons of, oh, you know what, I'm going to, you know, wait and see and, you know, let's see what happens there and stuff like that. Either you're at the wrong stage for them or a lot of these funds just don't have the conviction to say, hey, I'm, hey, I'm going to invest. Uh, and then that's the thing you want to basically screen when you're an early stage founder for the people who have that conviction, who can invest in you as a person. And that's obviously a very difficult thing to do. Also, when you're going through the founder's journey, you know everything that's wrong with your business as a founder. You know, okay, this right. area is not good enough and we need to plug that hole there and you know, this is not working. But when you're going to talk to investors, you have to focus on all the positives. You can't go in there and say like, we have all this other thing going on. You have to separate yourself as a CEO and um, the person who's familiar with the company's, I don't want to say dark underbelly, but where the things are not going well, <laughs> but also yeah. uh, go and talk about, hey, this is a thing that, the things that are actually going well. You have to be on those two levels at the same time, uh, which is not an easy skill. So I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up. I wanted to also touch on, so you mentioned the mistakes that you made. What mm-hmm. are some things that you would do the same that you did during Lemons and like best practices that you'd carry on with at your next company that you start? I would do the way that I built a movement exactly the same. This is actually something that Lemons taught me is a real skill of mine. And it's a lot of why the Immerse Accelerator is going as well as it is because I learned that in today's modern day and age, very few movement movements happen accidentally. Like someone sits down and makes a plan. I'm going to make this thing. I'm going to share it to these five people 
who I'm going to tell to share it to these 10 channels. And then I'm going to wait and contact each one of those people, make sure they share it to like those 10 channels and make sure like through that process, I'm going to get enough hype that I can then ride that wave into something bigger. When I was debuting Lemons, I literally went through my texts and I called every single person and I said, hi, I, you know me, I'm starting this company. It's this and this, and I'm trying to get investment for it. What I need you to do is I've sent you a LinkedIn post. I've sent you a tweet. I need you to post this at this time and this at this time. And I had them all do it. And then I reshared each of those posts to other people. And I don't need to get into all the details of why I did this. The more important point is from doing that, one of my LinkedIn posts went viral on a hashtag. And I had random strangers contacting me like, oh, this is really interesting. It's in diversity inclusion space. Let's chat. And that is how I met some investors who I still have relationships with, even though I'm not even running that company anymore. And if I had just sat down and been like, I'm starting this company, let me just put it out there and see what happens. I wouldn't be in this spot because it takes deliberate planning. And so I think it, it doesn't matter if you think that your thing is the best thing since sliced bread, right? If you have the perfect solution, if you have the elixir of life and no one knows about it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> like you have to make sure you have a plan to make sure that you can cut through the noise that exists today and be very deliberate about it. And also don't be ashamed to reach out to those people. At first I was terrified. It's like, oh my God, I'm going to sound like, hey, please do this thing for me. But once I did it the first few times, I was like, most people don't really care. If they know and like you, they'll do a small favor for you. And if they don't, who cares? They don't think about you on the day to day. And it's almost like being shameless. But I think I, I would have that same mentality, which is I view the world from my own perspective. So I think I'm the most important thing. But everyone else views the world from their own perspective too. They're not thinking about me. If I call them and ask them for a favor and they say no, they're not going to go tell all their friends about it. They don't, it, it doesn't matter. So I have very little to lose and I have everything to gain. And let me just have that approach when I'm doing it. I would do that exactly the same because I think that's what separates people who really want something from people who don't is what are you willing to do to make this thing happen? And honestly, if anything, I would have done that more, but I feel like I did a pretty good job of that. And it was a skill that is built into a muscle now for me. Whenever I think of a new thing, I have a strategy for distribution. And I think about that first because that is, at the end of the day, it's the quickest way to find out if the thing you're building matters. And it's the quickest way to scale it if it does matter. So thinking about distribution and being shameless and how you leverage your networks and your opportunities and your social capital and skills to get that thing out there, I would do that exactly the same. I love it. That's actually super interesting. There's a saying that first time founders focus on product where second time founders focus on distribution. And I think, you know, that's something that you reinforce there. I'm actually a bit curious about how you orchestrated the virality in this case. Could sure. you tell yeah. us a little bit about what exactly, who did you reach out to? What exactly did you tell them to do? And a little bit about the mechanics of the process. Because as someone yeah. who, you know, is growing a, a newsletter and podcasts and stuff like that, I'm actually very curious about like how this all happened. Even if you can't like replicate it hundred percent, I'm sure there's yeah. some lessons for, uh, the creators in our audience that can actually uh, take some things away. Sure. I made, I made four different versions of a LinkedIn post. I made three different versions of a tweet. I believe I made four different versions of a Facebook post and I had an Excel spreadsheet where I, each row was a person I knew and I had their names in there literally. And then each of the columns was a drop down that was like Facebook message a, or like Twitter message B or like whatever. And then I also had times of associated with each of those posts. So literally, I'm not kidding. I had a, I need to go find this spreadsheet because it was hilarious looking. And then I just went down the list and contacted them. And another thing I would say is a major key, make the friction as low as possible. Write the entire post and just be like, you can make changes, but it's already there. You can just copy paste it. If I could have made a way for them to click a link that automatically has the post in drafts that they can just hit send, I would have done it, didn't know how to do it then. And then I followed up. So I made reminders in my calendar when each person was supposed to post something. And I would text them, hey, like just checking in. If you post it, if you need help, reach out to me, whatever, and just sound nice about it. Because some people wanted to, but forgot because life gets in the way. And then once they posted it, I would reshare each post, both on my personal and also on my like company channels. And I made sure to be really consistent about the hashtags I was using. I don't remember which hashtags I was targeting at the time, but I chose a hashtag that was big enough that, it can, that I thought it would reach a large audience, but small enough that I thought one of my posts could really break through. 
And I think that's why one of them did because I didn't like hashtag startups. Like I'm never going to break through in hashtag startups, but I, I don't know if I did like hashtag NYC HR tech or something like that, then I have a much higher likelihood because I have just asked 15 people to post 20 to 30 times on different channels about this one thing in a very consistent, coherent brand message. And eventually that will seem to everyone in my networks like, whoa, this is so cool. <laughs> like, What is going on? So yeah, I, I know that's not as specific and granular. I wish I had written a playbook when I did it, but- That's actually think, super useful, yeah. I was gonna yeah. say a little bit more about who the actual people that you reached out to. So who are mm-hmm. these people you mentioned? Uh, this is how you kept in touch with one of your investors. Were they all mm-hmm. investors or were they people that you, like who are these people? Oh, friends. I, I didn't have any investor friends. I didn't know anyone. This is another thing I think, I'm glad you brought this up because most people getting started won't know investors. I didn't know any investors, but I knew that I was privileged. I went to Princeton, certainly in the network somewhere were people who were investors. And I just hit up as many Princeton friends as I could. I had friends from high school who were doing interesting things. So I made sure if you were a friend from high school, I would contact you. And then I also contacted my family members who I knew had worked at big reputable companies so that I could have more of a range of ages because most of my friends are between the ages of 20 and 35. But most of my parents and like aunts and uncles and them are, they'll have a broader spectrum of people. Obviously I had more luck with my friends than with my (laughs) like older family members. But at the end of the day, it actually showed me that you have more cheerleaders than you think. And maybe I'm just a person who's intensely anxious and introspective and thinks that I'm always messing things up. There's no shame. Just reach out. You know, worst thing they can do is ignore your text and who cares? They're not going to call the police because you texted them. So yeah, it was the reason I say I went through my contact list is because that's how I started the list. It was like, if I texted you in the past week, you're probably someone who frequently talks to me, you're highly likely to do it. And then once I was done going through my contact list or my texts, then it was, okay, let me go through my LinkedIn. Who in here would probably respond? Okay, let me go through like my prints and pictures. Okay. Oh, I haven't talked to that person in a while. Let me reach out to that person. So it was scrappy. There was no real serious methodology. It was how can I get as many people as possible and just reach out and expect a conversion rate of maybe 10 or 20%. But at the end of the day, it'll pay off. I love it. I love the line that you actually said, you have more cheerleaders than you think. Uh, yeah. That's something I think when you're a founder and you're going through it and it's just you and your co-founders, you forget about this support structure that you do have and the people that mm-hmm. are willing to spend five minutes of their day to do something for you because you're either a good friend or you've worked with them in the past. There's a lot of goodwill out there to tap into. And I think that the hustle and the grit and determination that you showed to tap into that is something that I think a lot of founders can model and something I'm going to keep in mind for my future entrepreneurial endeavors. Yeah, man. I do want to chat. The last question about lemons is why did you decide to leave? Yeah. So I decided to leave for, I guess, three reasons. The first is what I mentioned, which is it just seemed like once the COVID shutdowns happened and all these companies laying people off in mass, I did see how that could be an opportunity But I also saw that the road to climb had just immediately tripled. And so the thesis of my time investment, like whether or not it was worth it, like now I needed to have three times as much evidence as I did before. And I was already, I'm not too sure. So I think that was the straw that broke the camel's back. The second thing was that founder match that I was describing. Christine and I just viewed the world very differently. And we didn't, this didn't really come out until we had that moment where And I guess I didn't speak too much about this. We did our first client engagement and it went pretty well. We scrapped it together, tried to get hired, used our platform to show the one candidate who is atypical can actually do the job if you give them the chance. And it didn't work out with the client we were working with. And we were really bummed because we had a demo day coming up and our whole thing we were going to show was just this one experience. And so that was tough. And we were down in the dumps like, oh man, all the other teams in our cohort are showing this great traction and progress. And we're over here. We bet all our all our nickels on this one thing and it didn't work out. What are we going to do now? And it matters less from a business perspective and more from an emotional perspective because you learn so much about people when you're in that dumps period. And I think it just became clear that we just weren't as compatible from that worldview. And we could work out ideas of like, I think that this is true versus this is true. There are minor things you can work out with people, but core beliefs about how the world works, you're not going to convince someone to change their worldview. And if we were going to be co-founders of this company and hire people and grow and scale and take more investment, we needed to be on the same page from the first day. And so even, it's not like we like hated each other. We just were like, oh, if we're not on the same page now and we get bigger and things get more difficult, it's only going to get worse from here. So it's better to fail fast 
and just be like, you know what, it's okay. We'll move on and do what's next. And so I, I think there was that like lack of kind of cohesion on exactly how we saw the world. And, and I think the third piece was, and it just harkens back to what you mentioned earlier. I really asked myself the question, is this what I want to spend the next five to 10 years of my life doing? Is this the one problem I'm so passionate and obsessed about that I'm going to spend my time on it? And I couldn't say yes. Like I just, I couldn't come to a yes because I was so passionate about a lot of things. And I don't think it's wrong. And I think many people are like me where you have different interests and they pull you in different directions, but being an entrepreneur requires focus, just sheer focus on one thing. And I had seen that from working on the company. And so it was like, if I can't tell myself now I'm willing to focus deeply on this and only this and just work on it, no matter what happens, again, it's only going to get worse over time. So in this moment now, let me just make the tough decision of being like, you know what? I don't know what's going to happen next. <laughs> and a lot of people would think I'm crazy because I'm, I have, I've gotten funding and I have all this infrastructure and everything is there for me. People strive so hard to get here and you're going to leave. Someone actually told me this, but I was like, no, in my spirit, this is just, I can't say yes to this. I'm not going to say yes to five years of my life to this. I don't know. Maybe there's something else I'll say yes to and let me take my time elsewhere. So I think all of those things culminated in me just being like, similar to how I left Bain, where I was like, the logic might say, oh, we'll just ride this out and maybe it'll fail and then you'll start another company. But my spirit was like, no, you know that this is not the right thing for you. So just take the leap and see what happens on the other end. And I did, and it was rough for a while, but like now I'm here running this accelerator and I love what I'm doing. So, you know, it, it was tough, seriously. Again, similarly, I think leaving Lemons was even harder than leaving Bain because I, I, did, I left Bain to another job. I left Lemons to being unemployed for months with no plan in the middle of the greatest pandemic recession we'd ever seen. So that was difficult. In the end, I'm really glad that I did it. So That's fantastic. I remember we had a phone call when the time that you were thinking about leaving and you were basically mm -hmm. exploring and came to the conclusion that you and your co-founder are incompatible for the long run, which is right. one of those things in life. It happens, especially because I think of the nature of the accelerator program that you went through where it's like co-founder dating. You don't actually know yes. the person, you know, it's difficult to really get to know someone in just, I don't know, 10 to 12 weeks or however long the program was. Oh yeah. We, for context, Christina and I had only known each other for six weeks when we decided to start this company. Like we incorporated the company three months into knowing each other. So yeah. that's an important context there. Yeah. So it can't, it can't happen. But I think yeah. that the, one of the things that you mentioned is that, you know, as you said, this founder problem fit and this idea that mm -hmm. are you the person to try and go and break through walls to try and make this work? And the one idea that stuck out that you implicitly talked about was this idea of opportunity cost, which right. um, was a major factor in me leaving the startup that I uh, co-founded, mm -hmm. which is the idea of, look, uh, again, if you think of your, your career as something that you need to take control over, if you feel that you're just like being pulled along and not actually being proactive and in control of how you're growing. And if you feel like this is something that you're no longer uh, interested in and you, you're more passionate about other things, startups are labors of love. And so if you, the love yeah. is not there and if the passion is not there, then it's just another job. And it, what's worse is a job that you're not getting paid good money for. You're not right. getting like all the good insurance benefits and all that stuff. So mm -hmm. um, you might as well go and regroup your life until you're in a position where you can say, ah, this is something that I'm willing to sacrifice for and then let's take another stab at it. And I think that's, it's so courageous to say, and I've been there and I can empathize with, with this with you. You raised a bunch <laughs> of money. You've, you've basically told the world that, hey, this is something I'm going to bring into the world. And then you have to make the difficult decision to, to move on. But I'm glad, similar to you, I've also found that's the right decision. And I think that's something that trusting your gut is difficult to explain to other people. But you, at the end of the day, know that you're going to make the right decision. Yeah. You're the one who has to live your life. I actually didn't mention this about like the earlier part of my life is that was probably the first lesson in growing up that I learned. I lived my, my life for my parents for the first probably 18 years. And I got to college and was like, quite frankly, I have to do this. I have to wake up every day and be Yao. And that's all that matters. Everyone can tell me whatever they want to tell me. They don't have to be me every day and live the consequences of the decisions I make informed by whoever else is over there. So yeah, at the end of the day, your life will go however it goes. And all you have to, all you, the only person you can blame is yourself for your own decisions. Like, sure, I'm not like saying that all th bad things that happen to you are your fault. It's more like the person who has the most influence on your life is you. And so 
if you're the one who has to reap the benefits or costs of all your decisions, you should be pretty comfortable with them. And only your opinion really matters. And uh, so anyway, I, I, I really that. resonate with what you said. <laughs> Dude, that, that line that your opinion of yourself is the only one that matters. I think it's very important because as someone who I uh, grew up in South Africa, similar kind of societal pressures to take parts that were traditional and safe. I mean, and you can't really blame the people who had these views because they grew up in times yeah. that are much more difficult than we are. We live exactly. really fantastic lives where we're trying to go after self-actualization where they just mm. would fight for survival. So you can't yeah. blame them. It's not that they, their beliefs are just not suitable to the time that we are at right now. And I think you're right that you're the person that has to live your life at the end of the day. And if you're not happy with it and you can do something about it, then it is your responsibility to do that. And again, developing that intuition to listen to yourself is something that you've clearly mastered and are, and are coning oh, more and more. No, 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 no. <laughs> I am getting incrementally better at it. I am miles better than I used to be. It is a continuous process. <laughs> I love it. To something that you're doing right now, which is uh, focusing on this problem of diversity and inclusion in tech. On your LinkedIn profile, it says, my mission is to build ecosystems for underrepresented founders like me to thrive. And you're doing that right now in your role as a growth manager focused on founder inclusion. I really love this, what bubble and, and what you're doing in this role as someone who, for context, for the listeners who don't know, during my startup journey at Afari, we were three founders of color. Two of us were uh, international students in the States, or all, uh, all three of us were underrepresented minorities and stuff like that. It's a problem that's really important to tackle, but I'm curious about how you're going about solving it and your particular mm -hmm. angle of saying, okay, this is how we can make a dent in a problem that's so big that we could take many years and many you know, millions of dollars and billions of dollars to try and solve. So you could just tell us a little bit about your work at Bubble through the lens of, of diversity and inclusion in tech. Sure. And I think maybe I'll comment this from my understanding of the problem within the tech space and, and why yeah. it affects people of color, women, basically anyone who's not of the dominant political power group. The way that we've structured the tech industry, maybe let me start over. I fundamentally believe that systems never produce the wrong outcome. The fruits that you see is exactly how that system is supposed to work. So it's not the tech system is broken, it's that it was built for this outcome. The tech industry that as we see it today was built to fund upper middle class white men who go to good schools and know how to code. Like it was designed to do that because the way that we allocate capital to ideas is that the people with the most amount of capital are the arbiters and decision makers and how that capital is deployed, right? And so since there's a few people who get to make those decisions and everyone's got their own biases, we tend to relate more to people who look like us, who come from the same background. You mentioned this about finding investors, right? We all resonate with people who come from our own experiences. So if the small circle of people who we decide have all the decision-making power and how to allocate capital happen to be white men of privilege, most of the funding is going to end up going to white men of privilege. And that's only one angle. There's actually a lot of bottoms up parts of the system that also contribute to this. The way that we diligence founders, we look for great schools which are also have their own sets of systemic inequalities. We look for long years of experience at really reputable companies. Each of those companies has a hiring system that probably has some bias in it. And so Certain personality term, type as well. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. We, we have an idea of what a good founder looks like or a good founder sounds like. They're great salespeople. They can really convince you. They're very gregarious, but that's not necessarily correlated with success. It's just what we think is correlated with success. There are lots of mild mannered, women of color who would be who are exceptional leaders but we just don't see them as that and so it makes it harder for us to believe in them so the way that we structured it is designed to make this necessary outcome and the reason i start with that is because it's not about fixing the system it's either about destroying the system and building a new one or about taking this current system that was designed for this outcome and trying to make tweaks to it such that it can help the people we're trying to help maybe a little bit more which is not as exciting. It's not, it's not me coming over here with my burn the establishment down, like whatever. It's not that, but, and it's also not, don't worry, everything is well-meaning. We just need to like do this and this and everything's gonna be great. What I'm actually trying to do is take a system designed to help white privileged men succeed and build almost like secondary systems around it to help 
women of color and other people from underprivileged backgrounds hack their way into the system that was deliberately not designed for them. And that means you're going to take a very different approach than I think many people would. And it's why I've built a pre-accelerator. And so to land that into context, uh, could, so what immersed- I, I just want ahead. you to wait for one second. Sure. Could you tell the audience what is a pre-accelerator? Yes, let me explain. Okay, so okay. the path to, I'll start by orienting what, like the company path from idea to IPO. So you start as a person with an idea, you work on that idea, you raise what's usually called a pre-seed round, which is an investor just thinks you're really exceptional and the problem you're solving is worth solving. And they're honestly just betting on you as a person. They give you some money, you build your first MVP or whatever it is to prove out mm, this problem is worth solving. Eventually you demonstrate enough traction that other investors are like, this is interesting. Let's give them a seed round, which is maybe if the pre-seed was anywhere from $20,000 to $500,000 at the high end or something, a, pre a seed round is going to be something in the millions. Like here is serious money to hire a team and really build this out. And then once you progress there and you still show that this is worth solving, then you get to a series A and the series A thesis is these people have figured it out and we're just going to throw as much money as possible at their company so they can scale as quickly as possible. And once you hit that, then you start to scale. A series B is great, let's scale even faster. And then somewhere around there, you can choose to IPO or sell your company. That is the typical, and I know I've made a lot of generalizations here, but that is the typical path. What's happened is people have realized the system is designed to only really work that way for people who are men of privilege, <laughs> who know how to code themselves. And so what they realized is, okay, maybe we need to build some secondary infrastructure. And so people came up with this idea of an accelerator, which is basically just a a structure, it could be like a co-working space. It could just be people calling to check on you. But the idea behind the accelerator is here is a founder who just needs some help. Like we're going to get you maybe some growth marketing advice. We're going to like give you deadlines so you can build quickly. And the whole point of the accelerator is to get you prepped and ready to the point where it's much easier to raise money. Many accelerators actually will fund the founders that they put through the accelerator. And so if you can fit the accelerator into this framework that I put, it usually sits somewhere around the pre-seed or seed stage where it's designed to get you to catch up to where that privileged white man who knew how to code and built everything themselves would be. A pre-accelerator is the next step on top of that, which is accelerators are also themselves extremely exclusive. The best accelerators have acceptance rates of anywhere from two, 3%, some are this less This would be like Y Combinator or something like that? Exactly. Your Y Combinator, your 500 startups, like these top accelerators are very hard Tech to stars, get into. stars, stuff like yes. that, yeah. And because it's so hard to get into, you have the same problem again. Only people who fit a certain mold end up getting into those acceler pre accelerators because they also have things that they look for in terms of how fast your company is progressing. But th the thing that sucks about it is most of it is knowledge. If you were to tell someone when they're 18, hey, accelerators are looking for these things. You have the next six years of your life, work on getting those things together and get into that accelerator. You would have a lot more diverse people in these accelerators. The problem is there is no real way for us to propagate that information to people. And so people apply and most of the underprivileged people don't get in. So a pre-accelerator is designed to prep people for the accelerator, which is designed to prep people for raising that round and scaling their company. And I know it's a whole long thing, but the point is, what I'm trying to do is build that mechanism so that people can get just the grassroots foundation knowledge. And also because Bubble is a no-code platform that empowers people to build, they can actually have a product that they can get some traction on. So that when they apply to that accelerator, it's not, hey, I have this idea in a pitch deck. It's, hey, I have this idea, a pitch deck. I researched it. I built this product and look what I've learned from my users on my product. Please give me a chance in this accelerator so I can have a fighting chance. And that's what I'm trying to do with Immerse at first. But I also have grand ambitions and we can maybe get into that if you're curious. <laughs> I love it. So just to clarify, someone comes to you, they fit mm -hmm. your uh, profile of the kind of person that you're looking for. Uh, I'm curious, you always talked about that everyone's looking for a certain profile. What is the kind right. of profile that would be uh, suitable to go through the Immerse uh, Bubble Accelerator? Yeah. Or pre-accelerator. Um, Sure, it's a free accelerator, yes. So I, I think the, the profile I'm looking for is typically someone who's a first-time founder because I think that's the profile of people who need the most help. First-time founder of color. Our first cohort was for Black and Afro-Latinx founders. As we scale to next year, I'm hoping to expand it to all founders of color who identify as Indigenous or a person of color. So someone who's a person of color, probably a first-time founder, who's done as much work as they think they possibly could have given the resources that they have. And I know that sounds vague, but let me make it more specific. A good example is someone who 
they saw a problem in say like the beauty space and they're really familiar with it and they wanted to build something to solve it, something tech related, something software, and they can't build anything. But what they could do is call a hundred beauty influencers, talk to them and get to know their problems, spend all this time just really getting to understand their customers and their users and their problem. And what is it that they're trying to do? They're working a job and using that to fund on their side, like them going to speak to people. The only thing standing really between them and their business functioning is the fact that they don't have a product to get any real learnings from. If you're that person, you're a person of color, you really care deeply about a problem, you've spent months <laughs> like understanding this problem, studying it, talking to your target customer or demographic, and you just need a product so you can go back to those same people you're speaking to and say, does this fit your needs? How can I make it better? That is the profile of founder that we're looking for. And it's broad, but I found that it actually is a very narrow slice of people because most people who have ideas aren't willing to do all that work. And most people who are doing all that work usually have products. <laughs> so it's someone who's willing to do the work and they just have that product as a stopping point because that's where Bubble can really be the most helpful. And one thing that you've mentioned before is that you take them through the process of saying, okay, now that they've done some maybe customer research or they mm -hmm. have built some of that user empathy, how can you actually build a product and one question that I actually wanted to dig into is, you know, how do you define no code? Because I think that coming from a mm -hmm. person who studied computer science in college, there's various levels of abstraction to how you interact with computers. And even myself, who is, I have a computer science degree, I write code in my job. I don't consider myself working on the really low level stuff that like, okay, these are hardcore programmers. And the way that I think about no code is just like a natural extension of the increasingly uh, abstract way that we interact with code in order to say, okay, I want to solve a problem. How can I like do so in the way that's as quick as possible in the same way that uh, if I want to write a certain program, I can use a language that forces me to be like, okay, let me write it in zeros and ones, or I can mm -hmm. write it in like a programming language, or I can uh, use an application to solve the problem, something like that. How do you see no code helping people? And is no code only useful to people who don't know how to code or can technical people actually take advantage of it as well? Yeah. First thing, I'm so glad that you've contextualized it as a further abstraction on other existing abstractions, because I think that is one of the things people fundamentally misunderstand about the no code movement, which is that coding as we see it now, isn't what coding was 50 years ago. We have abstracted it immensely. And this is just the next step to answer your question about, is it only for people who are non-technical versus technical? Bubble's original users were technical users. Like Bubble's original people who were like, this is incredible, were developers who were like, I have to spend weeks trying to build something to prove whether it's worth it. If I learn this tool, this Bubble tool, I can spend a day and get the same information, right? So it is actually very attractive to a technical person who's just looking to scale quickly, get user insights much faster because- Could you actually just easier explain- to what okay. bubble is. I realized we never actually yeah, talked we, about we that. Did not and then it. we can talk about the who is it for next. Sure. Uh, yeah. Bubble is a, a no-code platform that allows people to build basically any type of software that they're looking to build without having to type in code as we understand code. It's what we call visual programming, where it's more of a drag and drop and typing in if statements, as we call workflows, uh, that say, when you click this button, I want these things to happen. To building a platform that way instead of building a platform by having a terminal and typing in different commands. That to me is the simplest way I can explain what Bubble is. If you're familiar with a Wix or a Squarespace, it's basically that, except instead of building a landing page, you can build Facebook or Instagram or you know WhatsApp. That's what Bubble is. So it works for like computer. mobile applications and web apps and stuff like that? Yeah, Bubble is primarily for web apps. You can, there are many people who build on Bubble and then use wrappers to build their web apps into mobile apps. But what Bubble does best is the web app. Cool. No, that, that makes a ton of sense. I see Bubble as being, an, or attempting to try and be like the AWS for no code applications where the mm -hmm. things that it prices on and stuff like that are very similar to your cloud providers like AWS and DigitalOcean where it's, okay, if you build on this, we'll host your site and you can use our services to compose your application. So I think it's very interesting. I'd love to actually talk to maybe the co-founders or the engineering team or something like that, just to hear more about like their vision for it. But I'm curious about like how this actually, and I think it, it, it's clear to me, but I, I want you to actually go into it is how does this actually sure. bring bridge the gap for things like accessibility and things like empowering the target demographic that you're looking to empower? 
Sure. And I'll use my own personal uh, story as an example. So we talked about Wave, right? When I wanted to build Wave, I was like, oh, I need a product so I can get some feedback. I ended up call, hiring external developers, like an agency from India. And I was like working with them, but there was like both a language barrier and also just like a communication barrier. It was hard. And I also realized that I, there's a difference between design and programming. I didn't know that. So I was outsourcing both design and programming, which makes it infinitely more difficult to figure out what to build. And I ended up spending literally thousands of dollars and I got a product I could not use and I couldn't fix it because I didn't build it and I didn't know what to do about it. And to contextualize that into kind of the long journey of how you raise money or become a, a founder, originally as a pre-seed company, you could just have a pitch deck and they would fund you. Because there are so many more companies in the space, you cannot get a pre-seed check without traction. You can't get traction without a product. You can't build a product if you can't code. <laughs> if you can, and I know these are terms that you and I understand, yeah. but if you could just explain what is traction to people who are, might not be familiar with it. Sure, traction is proof. And proof usually takes the form of a number of people who are using your platform and love that platform. And so if I were to show traction on like a barbershop that I founded, I'd be like, in the last month, we've cut 300 people's hair and they give us a 4.5 star review. And the number of people who come into our barbershop is increasing at 10% every week. That is traction. And when VCs say they want traction, that's usually what they're looking for. They're basically just trying to hedge their bets and by looking at these numbers that is traction, then they feel more confident that by giving you money, they're not throwing it away because people actually want what you're building. The problem with that is to get traction on my barbershop, I need to have a barbershop, right? <laughs> to get traction on my software product, I need to have a product. To, but to build that product, I either know, need to know how to build it myself or I need to be able to afford to pay someone to build it for me. Paying people to build it typically costs anywhere between $5,000 and $50,000, depending on what you're trying to build. And if you're a person from an underrepresented background who's been systemically excluded from capital formation for generations, it's highly unlikely you have 50 grand sitting around to see if your idea is worth building. And you're also unlikely to have gone to a high school that promoted enough computer science programs that you learned how to code yourself. And now maybe you're working a full-time job and there's no way that it makes sense for you to spend a year, two years learning a new language so you can build this thing and test it. And so there's this it's also very difficult to recruit technical co-founders, as you and I were discussing previously. It's, yes. You need to be able to convince someone who, say, ideally, I, at the time I was working on my own uh, tech startup, maybe some of your friends who do know how to code work at Google or they have their own jobs and you have to try and convince them that, hey, I have this idea. Can you spend hours of your life to build this thing that actually yes. might not, might not uh, go anywhere? Uh, and so it's a really hard sell. And so you are saying that no code can actually bridge this gap a little bit such that people who have this idea can actually build the first version of the product without any external help. Instead of paying someone else or trying to give someone else equity in your company, you instead mm -hmm. uh, use the platform and try and put something together. Yeah, yeah. It's the quickest way to tell if your idea is worth doing, right? If I known how to use Bubble fluently, when I thought of Wave, I could have built it in a couple of days, tested it out and figured out within two weeks, this is not worth spending my time on. And I could have saved myself the months and months that it took for me to find that same result. That to me is the most immediate no-code thesis because creating a great company isn't about coming up with the best idea first. It's actually about how quickly you iterate until you find something that's actually worth it to the customers that you're trying to serve. And so that time is really what you're trying to buy. And no code gives you so much more time back because you can iterate much faster. And so specifically, especially for people who don't have that access, people from different backgrounds, no code can really be the key to entering this industry and really getting to build something out because now you've taken that $10,000, $50,000 hurdle away from them. You've empowered them to build whatever they think of and you've empowered them to buy back that time so that they can spend it really building their business instead of sitting around waiting for someone to code something for them. And I'm curious about what sort of things people have built. Maybe you can give us some like stories of people who are like in the accelerator right now and what they're, what they're building with it. Yeah. So we have one person who is building a company or a software product that lets people of color who are looking to enter a company have authentic conversations with people who are working at that company already, similar to a blind, but much more about the community centered dynamic. We have one founder who is productizing the natural hair journey. For those of you listeners who have natural hair, I have natural hair. I don't take care of it entirely because I don't want to spend the time and energy <laughs> trying to figure out what to do. And so they're building a product that literally will send reminders to you 
this is specifically what you need to do at this time based off of getting and understanding your data. And I'm trying to think, there's another person who's building, imagine it as, I think she calls it like, it's like Tinder for roommates. So imagine like your spare room experience, except you really get to know the people on a personal level. And she's built a software product that makes that easy for people to engage. So you can build a B2B product, you can build a CRM, you can build something to just automate your daily tasks. There are people on the Bubble forum who, who use Bubble to cut the number of hours they need to spend on their job from 40 to 10 so they can spend two whole days doing nothing every week. And then there are people who've built companies, gone through Y Combinator and raised millions of dollars. So the scope of what you can build is actually pretty endless. But within our accelerator, it's mostly consumer focused businesses because I think that's what relates most to, to the founders of color that I'm speaking to. And I would say half of it is solving the specific need of underrepresented people. Um, and about half of it is trying to build on existing software platforms that aren't quite filling the need of a customer demographic that they found by spending their time researching and understanding them. Super interesting. So it seems you can use this similarly to how you'd use like a programming language. The limit is your imagination rather than imposed by the platform or the software. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, moving on to the accelerator part. So you've basically painted this picture of what is Bubble? Who is it useful for? Why does it exist in the world? To the piece that you have been instrumental working on, which is the accelerator, which is called Immerse, or the pre-accelerator, which is called Immerse. How is your journey basically uh, first coming up with that idea? And this is something that's needed. And mm -hmm. secondly, launching and running that. Uh, could you just tell us a little bit about that? Because I'm sure there's a lot to, to chat about there. Oh, yeah. So while I was actually speaking with Emmanuel before I ended up working here, we were thinking through what was what is one big move we could make that would make a huge difference in the space and show that we really care about inclusion for underrepresented founders. And the first thing I thought of was, how do we overcome that product hurdle, given that Bubble can do that? Like, how do we overcome that product hurdle in an authentic way? And so I thought to myself, okay, in the, back to the framework of we can't burn down the system, but we can work within it. And if I can build something to empower and equip people to get into the existing system of accelerator through fundraise, I think that would be huge value. So I was like, all right, I'm going to build a program that is deliberately designed to tack on top of everything else that exists, but source people who would never, ever have those opportunities. And that was where out of that birthed Immerse. And we specifically decided to start with Black and Afro-Latinx founders in large part because I am a Black founder and I was like, I understand myself and other people like me really well, but also because in the moment it was the thing to do to really invest and show that we cared. And so that was the idea. Now, when it came down to the execution, no guidance, it was figure it out, right? As most people would. So I thought to myself, okay, we'll put up an application. I will build a landing page and I'm going to try to build the institutional structures that every excel like typical accelerator would have but with basically no money. <laughs> so I was like, okay, we're gonna need an instructor to teach Bubble because they need products by the end. So then I ended up uh, meeting Marielle, who's our lead instructor. She's incredible. We kind of tag team the program. Did, and so did that was she, step one. Was she at the company or was it someone you uh, recruited to join Bubble? Marielle is a Bubble instructor who teaches our boot camps, which is eight week programs that will get you a product at the end, or they teach you how to use Bubble. And so, I reached out to her and was like, hey, I'm thinking of doing this thing. It's for Black and Afro-Latinx founders. And she was like, I'm Afro-Latinx, let's do it. So that was probably the first, earliest, most intelligent move I made. <laughs> and I hope Mariel hears this because I really mean it. Once I had that, then I, I thought through what will the duration be? And honestly, because of the amount of time we had left before like winter break would hit, I was like, all right, 10 weeks. It's going to be a 10-week program. And then I was like, what happens at the end? And I'd seen most accelerators will have demo days to show how founders have progressed. So I was like, okay, it'll end with a demo day. And most of the programming will be helping them get their products built. And we'll also add elements of coaching because as I mentioned, a lot of what prevents these founders from succeeding is not necessarily knowing information about how the system works. And so we added one-on-ones so we could check in with them and really help them understand how are you positioning your company? What's your strategy? Um, are you doing go-to-market? That type of work. And so from that kind of amorphous idea, I built institutional structures. We have weekly programs. We have weekly one-on-ones. And I just check in with each of the founders as they're building. But as anything, when I planned it at first, very quickly in, it was like, oh, snap, what do we do if a founder is building a product, but then they realize two or three weeks in, maybe this is the product I want to build. What do I do now? We had to answer that question. I was going to uh, ask, like, how did you yeah, let people know this existed exactly. in the world and source the 
the accelerator companies or accelerator founders? Yeah, I, I honestly just thought to myself, what type of program would be interesting to me? And I just built that. So I, I wrote, if you go to the Immerse website, all of that copy was written by me. I literally just started writing. Most founders don't have this, and this is how this industry works, and you need a product, and you don't have one, and you talk to people, and it's expensive. Hey, I built a program for you, if this is your problem. I, talked, I tried to find some bubble founders already who existed, who had been through this whole system, and I hit them up. Marge is one of them. She's the person whose video is on the site now, as of today. And I was like, hey, do you want to do a testimonial talking about your issues? And she was like, sure. And then I hit up Nate Washington from Coins. He's doing extremely well. And I was like, hey, man, do you also want to do a video? And I put their videos together, edited it, and made the promo video that's on the Immerse page. And then I just wrote as many frequently asked questions as I could to try to avoid people bombarding me with emails, launched it, had to send an email to the bubble listserv, and then just started, I think I posted on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and told all my friends, going back to that same thing, I was on my Instagram DMing people, hey, this exists, hey, this exists, posting constantly so people knew. And that was my basic strategy. And I just hoped for the best. And it worked out. We got over 700 applications for the first cohort. And we could only accept 10 people. And guess who was evaluating every application? This guy. <laughs> so that was a week of my life. And Wow, that's like 100 a day. That's a long week. <laughs> It was a long week, but it was very much worth it. And I, one of the things that I really hope that people who went through the application process will see is that I read every word of every application and tried my absolute best to be unbiased in the way that I made my decisions. And obviously I wasn't perfect. Like I ended up actually making a second bootcamp for people who I thought were promising, but didn't quite make it. And that actually formed its own community. I love them. They're the best. I really think that having that empathy drive a lot of my decision-making is I hope the difference maker between our program and others. So that, that kind of brought us to great. Now it exists. But then I also had to be like, I said, this demo day is going to connect people. And I think if you look at the language to the tech community and investors, when we launched the program, I had zero of those things. <laughs> so I was like, okay, how am I going to do that at all? And I started with my network. I just reached out to people. Hey, I'm doing this thing. And it was popular at the time, like programs for black people. So I feel like I had some tailwinds there. But basically just was like, honest, hey, I'm building this. It's not 100% there yet. We've got some really great people. Would you be interested in attending this demo day? Would you be interested in coming to speak to the cohort? So I ended up finding, honestly, incredible people who'd raised money. A few investors each week would come and speak to our cohort just because I emailed and texted people. And Marielle similarly emailed and texted people. And so we kind of got that piece together. And then the final thing I was really hoping to do was build partnerships between our pre-accelerator and some accelerators so that if you go through our program, you're guaranteed at least to have serious developed relationships with some accelerators. So I called Antler. <laughs> I was like, I had a, hey, I'm doing this. I know I used to be a founder for y'all. Check me out. And like uh, the people I hit up with, oh, so glad to hear from you. Let's hear about it, right? Back to the whole point of you have more cheerleaders than you think. I did not expect them to respond so positively. And then I ended up talking to Navi, who's the head of technology at Antler. And he was like, I'm all for this one of your founders is going to get into the Antler program. Let's build this as a formal partnership. Let's announce it. So that's going to be announced in a week or a week and a half. And that was our first formal partnership. <laughs> and then I used that partnership to get other partnerships. So then I went to other people, hey, this is the program. We're working with Antler. Would you like to be involved? And I got a lot of great positive feedback. And so now we're building this engine of partnerships because what I hope to build in the end is, like I said, an ecosystem, right? Where... There's the Immerse main program, maybe we build supplement programs, but the real value you're getting is you're filling that knowledge gap and you're building relationships within the industry that you would never have gotten access to. And that way you can chart your own path. If you don't want to raise VC funds, don't do it. If you want to raise VC funds, go do it. If you just want to like leverage those relationships for clout, do what you want to do. The point is we're trying to help you get from I'm stuck because I have no product and I don't know what to do to I know what to do and I have a product and I will do whatever I want. That's such a wonderful story. story. It, it's yeah. really great to see how this developed like from an idea to doing the demo day, building the relationship. It's really like building something from nothing. I'm curious about, so is the first cohort finished or are people still in the middle of it? They are still in the middle of it. We are, our demo day is on December 16th at 3 p.m. I don't know, 3 p.m. Eastern time. I don't know if this will be out by then, but so our demo day is then, they're all building, most are complete. And we're basically in the refining stages where we're trying to get their products to go from, oh, this is an MVP that a user would be cool with to, whoa, this looks completely indistinguishable from any like coded software platform, just because I want to show that it's possible because I know that it is. So yeah, we're still in it. 
but we're close. And one thing that you mentioned, I know when we were texting back and forth is you really see yourself as a really good fit for the work that you're doing right now. And so I'm curious about what are your ambitions for, you know, this accelerator and your role at Bubble. It's clear that you found some uh, really good alignment in this diversity and inclusion space, you know, given your mm-hmm. own experience as a founder and your entrepreneurial personality and experience. I'm curious about where do you see this developing and your own ambitions for your own career? Yeah, what, what I'm really hoping to do is leverage the position that I'm in to create enough change within the space that people start to, that I start to develop a reputation, right? One of the things that I've started to learn about the tech industry is everything is about what other people would say about you, right? It's about that recommendation. And I think that I I have a solid, you know, reputation now. I wouldn't be where I am if I didn't, but I think the stage of a journey of my career that I'm at now is I'm just building that reputation so that people can start to understand oh, I associate Yao with really great diversity and inclusion content and programming within the tech space. And I think once I can check that box, it opens up a whole world of opportunities for me because I would like to eventually get back into starting my own company. I'm not sure when I'm going to do it. And because of what I learned the first time, I'm going to be very, very specific and very discerning about which problem I choose to solve. And I know that building that reputation will make building that company infinitely easier. And I don't know what the timeline on it will be. I think I'll be spending a lot of time here, expanding the Immerse program, doing the next step of whatever makes sense, trying to speak anywhere and everywhere so that people can get to know me, what I'm doing, why Bubble is great, why the Immerse program is helpful, and why this story that I mentioned of how tech is designed specifically for people not to prosper and how we can work within the system to make incremental change. I want to get that story out there as much as possible, and that's my immediate next step. But I hope to get to a point where... I'm a person who gets a lot of inbound because if people know me and my brand and my story and I can leverage that reputation and leverage that influence to do even more because <laughs> Immerse is great, but starting like a completely radical $500 million fund that only invests in people you would never think of and is really equitable in that exchange would be incredible. And I'm, I, this is, I'm not saying I'm going to do that. I just, that was the craziest thing I could think of today. But I think I'm the type of person who can do something that ridiculous. I just need to get enough people to believe that I'm a sane person who can do stuff so that I can make those risks and really make changes. And maybe I'll fall flat on my face, but no one will say I didn't try. I love it. I'm certainly going to be watching your journey closely. And who knows, maybe in the future we can collaborate on certain things. But yeah, I think it's, it's wonderful how you went from, I'm an entrepreneurial person, I'm a founder, I'm going to look at working at a company as my next step. But I think it's a wonderful example of how you can still be entrepreneurial, even within working within a company, you can still do these zero to one kinds of initiatives where you're basically taking something that wasn't there. And now there's a whole program and you're expanding it and you're building relationships and all that. Again, it's a wonderful example of aligning your personal goals and how you want to grow as a person with the company's goals. Because obviously Bubble in this case, this is a growth initiative for them. This is how they increase their user base. This is how they reach Mm -hmm. people who need the product. But Mm -hmm. also for you, it's about how can I prove my execution abilities? How can I increase my network? And it's a wonderful example of how you can align those two. And so you're really like practicing what you're preaching in in early on when you're giving that advice. It's always a nice Mm -hmm. thing to to see. Yeah. No, it's, it's crucial. At this point, I would not, and I know I'm privileged enough to say this, but I absolutely would not take any positions that did not also deliberately and very specifically align with what I was trying to do, because I know that I can. And it's also a lot of why I said earlier, I spend most of my time is spent doing really boring, unsexy stuff, but I still love my job because it matters and because I know it's part of this journey. So I really hope that, you know, everybody listening can get there because it's really, you're on the other side of the fence. And when you get there, it really is rewarding and it's worth it. I'm sure you've inspired me certainly, and I'm sure you've inspired a lot of our listeners to think about how they can take that ownership and how they can uh, structure and architect their career in order to you know, achieve the goals that they want to do. So thank you so much again for that. Of course. I'm always out oh. here to help people finesse. Fantastic. But yeah, we got to finesse it. That's the thing. There's all of these systems. And I think as someone who has been through it, you know, okay, this is how you can massage the system to give the outcome that you want. And at the end of the day, it's about democratizing uh, access to that kind of information, which I'm glad you're doing it on this podcast. A lot of people are going to benefit from it. 
I want to move on to some general questions that I ask everyone just to wrap things up. I know we've talked about a lot of things about your work and your previous experience, but this is just some general questions to help the audience get to know you better. Sure. The first question is the name of this podcast is Learn with Aftar. And so I want to know what's something that you've learned recently. What have I learned recently? I want to give an interesting answer to this because I learn things constantly. For context, I listen to podcasts all the time. I, I like try to read as much as I can. My girlfriend makes fun of me constantly about how I'm always trying to learn stuff. So I don't want to give some like granular fact that I'd heard. Oh, actually, I learned that, hmm, this sounds kind of corny, but your personal life has a lot more to teach you than you think. My relationship with my girlfriend has taught me more about myself and my career than anything in my career taught me. Learning how to be really patient and love someone unconditionally and empathetically, especially if you didn't come from an upbringing that did that. Like my house, I love my parents, they love me, but sometimes it felt very conditional. You heard me say how they were like, you need to be a doctor, lawyer, engineer. I'm increasingly learning how my upbringing really formed and shaped the way that I think about interacting with people authentically. And being in this relationship with this woman I love so much, but trying to communicate that in a way that sits and resonates with her has really shown me, one, that I have a lot of work to do about my upbringing, but also, two, the parts of me that work so well as a founder, as someone who works at Bubble, like my communication skills and how that's gotten me out of like pickles and it's really helped us get over problems and stuff. <laughs> I feel like I'm speaking like we're in this like horrible relationship. Everything is great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm just an honest person about making things work with people. If you're in a really serious relationship, it takes sacrifice and work. And I think that I viewed it at first almost as like a nuisance where I was optimizing for the least amount of work possible. And now I view it as a growing experience where every new thing that we're tackling together is an opportunity for me to grow. And changing that frame has been probably the biggest immediate learning that I've, that I've had. So it's an indirect answer, but it's the actual truth. It's very interesting. I'm curious about what led you to change that mindset. Cause it sounds like incredibly, you're incredibly self-aware and you realize, hey, I had this one pattern of doing things. How did you actually make the change to viewing things in a different way? I think, how did I make that change? At some point, it, I realized that I was always trying to, I realized at some point this year, probably due to the fact that it's COVID and we're home all the time and you spend all your time with other people, like I realized that most of the actions that I do are very planned. Like I'm always trying to achieve something and great relationships work because you're just trying to make the other person happy. Like you're just, you're, it's not like you are like, I'm going to get this person because that's going to get me something in the future. It's this person is great and I just want them to know how great they are. And like you receive the same thing and those are the most authentic relationships. And I don't know when it clicked, but at some point this year it clicked that I had been taking that approach that I do at work that works so well. Like I'm trying to get 700 applications for this immersed thing. So I'm going to do this, 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 this. I realized that I had been trying that approach in my relationships and it was causing problems that just didn't need to be there. And so I was like, wait, what if I just tried my best to make this person feel great? And I just used that as my frame. And then just things got so much easier. And I was like, that is, what have I been doing this entire time? So it wasn't even like I was trying to learn the lesson. I just one day thought about it and then decided to make a small shift and it just radically changed the way that my life worked. And so I was like, oh, dope. Okay. Like, I wish I had learned this earlier, but here we are. I love it. This is a podcast. You don't just learn about success in startups, but also success in love. So I'm glad you're keeping the range of conversations <laughs> uh, really alive. Yeah, man. Hey, I'm an open book. <laughs> I love it. On the topic of success, what does success mean to you? That is a great question. What does success mean to me or what do I think success means? In your life, what, what would you consider a successful life if you had to look back at it or as you're planning to in your career and your personal life, what does success mm -hmm. mean to you in the context of your life? Yeah, I'll know I've succeeded if I made tangible impact on the problems I care the most about. That could look like maybe out of the Immerse Accelerator comes one great company that ends up raising tons of money and is a person who we all know never would have gotten a chance before it. So it could take that form. It could take the form of 10 people's lives getting incrementally better who I never meet just because of a few decisions that I made. I don't know what that's gonna look like and I don't actually measure it because it's not really worth my time. But to me, that's what success looks like. 
But I think at a higher level, what success is, yeah, I guess it's setting a goal and, and reaching it, whatever that goal is. It could be you're trying to get better at working out. It could be that you're just trying to be a better person. And it's directional and not it's not about getting to the end goal. It's, it's really just about working towards it. And so I think if you're always striving to be better at whatever it is you're trying to do, then, then that's success in itself, because you have to fall in love with the journey, not the destination, or you'll always be unhappy. Super, super profound. When you hear the word successful, who's the first person that comes to mind? Prince. Okay. Why, why Prince? I don't know. I just, I got a vision of Prince, probably because I think Prince redefined so many different aspects of the industry, of society, of like how we think about masculinity, of what we think genres are. Like for people who don't know, like Prince was technically a rock artist who was also an R&B artist who he just didn't fit any boxes. And he did that. He also was an ecosystem builder himself. Like he made a lot of connections that produced movies we love and produced tracks we love. He put like actresses and actors we don't even know about on just by having parties and introducing people. And I don't know why I, I find, I think that is an incredible life. And if I can do anything close to that, even one tenth of what he did, I would find my life to be very successful. So that's probably why he popped up. <laughs> Super interesting. I would have expected some entrepreneur or someone like that. So it's, it's a wonderfully interesting answer. Yeah. Uh, I want to go back to something that you mentioned earlier. You said you read a lot of books, listen to a lot of podcasts. I'm curious mm-hmm. about what's the book that had the most impact on you? Ooh, that's a tough question. Well, anyway, I read this book once that talked really authentically about mental illness and faith in a way that I'd never heard before. Um, you know, I've always grown up with like my fair share of like mental struggles and I kept it a secret for most of my life because one, it's hugely taboo. And two, I just didn't understand how I could fit it into the framework of the faith that I had growing up. And I remember I read this book that was written by someone who was of the faith, but also a little bit removed that was basically just saying, it's okay to be you, like you're designed the way that you are. And a lot of the things you go through are because of your traumas and because of your epigenetics, but that doesn't make you not a good person. And that I think was the beginning of me starting to think of myself less as a shitty product and thinking about myself more as a constantly evolving person. And that if I'm not great right now at something, it's okay. If I'm having a hard time with something, it's okay. Um, Like I'm worthy of existence and love just by virtue of who I am. And I'm, it's, it sucks that I can't remember the name of this book, but, but maybe I will eventually. <laughs> I love it. I think the point that you made about being worthy of love and belonging just mm-hmm. for being who you are, it's a struggle that I think we, we all go through. I've written about this in an essay on um, conditional self-worth, where I talk mm-hmm. about people like you and I who have achieved quote unquote, a lot of things being good at school and going to a good university and stuff like that, you can fall into this trap where you only think that you're worthy as a person if you get good grades, or if you achieve uh, this thing, or if you go to this school or something like that. And so I think it's wonderful that you've also come to the conclusion that, and it's difficult because you can uh, mentally understand it, but to emotionally remember it and to uh, live that every single day, again, it's a constant struggle because while you're trying to achieve worldly things, it's easy to fall back into that mindset of, okay, I'm not, if this thing doesn't go well, then that means like I'm a failure and things right. are not going well in my life. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a very, uh, it's a struggle that I think we all go through. On that point, how do you actually keep that top of mind when you're actually going through difficult situations? The fact that, you know, your self-esteem and who you, like your worth as a person isn't conditional on success or failure of any endeavor. Yeah, I'll say I have lots of help. So my therapist is really helpful. My girlfriend is really helpful. My immediate friend circle is really helpful. Because they understand me, they try to build me up because they know that I need that. So I'm very grateful to them. I also have built up a lot of secondary habits that also help with this. So I journal every day. And when I journal, I start my journaling by talking about what I'm grateful for. And then I end my journaling by just writing great things about myself. Like I call it daily affirmation and I'm just like, I am great. (laughs) I deserve love. I, whatever, it's okay that I can't do this. And it sounds crazy and dumb. And I really thought it was dumb the first few times I did it, but I find that it makes it easier for me to get out of bed because I'm like, "Eh, it's going to be fine. I've also started exercising a lot, which I think helps both psychologically and physiologically. You get more endorphins. 
and I try to do at least one thing that's just for myself every day. Right now it's the exercise because I'm stuck inside all the time, but hopefully when things get better, I can go outside and do more interesting things. But the culmination of all of those things, the external support systems that I have, <clears throat> my internal efforts to try to do things for myself and just like better myself, I think collectively make it easier for me to be like, you know what, I am deserving, I am okay, everything is good, even if things don't feel it right now because of these systems. And I know it's true because I'm not that different than I was two years ago before I did these things. And I feel radically different about my life. So highly encourage people to do those things. It sounds dumb, but it works. What was the thing that made you take on this journaling and affirmation practice? Like, how did you discover it and why did you decide to do it? Or was this, so how did, yeah, or where did you encounter this and decided that this is something you should do? Yeah, I, I, I probably, my therapist said it enough times that I finally was like, fuck it, fine, I'll do it. So again, more, please, everyone see a therapist. If I can, if you could take one thing away from me other than all the promotional stuff, like you don't have to be like depressed or anything to see a therapist. Like having someone just to speak authentically about what you're going through is extremely valuable. So it was probably my therapist just telling me to do it over and over again. But also I'm the type of person who likes to write. So I think it also just fits and works well for me where I like to express my thoughts and I'll just write, write, write. And it's because I think there's the external pressure of, hey, try this, it might work. And also the naturally you would like to write and you also love to talk about yourself. So this is perfect. I think that that's how I landed on it. Super interesting. I think that advice, everyone can learn from it. And funnily enough, I also have a journaling practice starting off with gratitude. And mm -hmm. I think the affirmations part is something that I never really considered mainly because I'm always you know, thinking about what is the next thing? How can we go out about this? There's a wonderful book that um, really changed my life quite a bit by Brene Brown called The Power of Vulnerability. It was actually an audio book. Mm. But uh, in it, she talks about there's really two fundamental needs that human beings have. One is love and one is belonging. And for so many of us, we believe that is conditional on something. And so to know that you're worthy of love and belonging just for who you are is one thing. And then obviously what people can take away from you is you can actually have these practices to reinforce that such that it's not an intellectual recognition but more of something that you live every day and something that you continually reinforce because it's so easy to slip back into old habits. Yeah, if you think about it this way, I think the intellectual argument that did it for me is you to think about all the times during your daily life where you're told the opposite of that, which is all the time. Like when I was, we were both at Princeton, like Princeton is an institution almost designed to show you how you ain't shit. So, oh, here's a class. You have six weeks to learn everything about medieval history and I will make sure everything and test you on it. And so you're just constantly told that maybe you're not good enough. You're at a job that evaluates you and says, here are the ways in which you're not great. Sure, you're good at this, but what about these things you could be better at? And so I'm just like, what chance do I stand at believing I'm great if all I hear all day is that? I have to start fighting those messages. And so you can almost think about the support systems I built as me just trying to counter those messages. So maybe at work, I'm going to hear how I messed something up or something's going to fall through the cracks and whatever. But then in my own and personal life, I tell myself I'm great. My girlfriend also tells myself I'm great. And like my friends also tell me that I'm great. So now it's more balanced, right? I don't think I'm great, like the best. I don't think I'm terrible. I think I'm okay. And I think it's okay. It's kind of like, okay, the last metaphor I'll use is smoking. So before they banned smoking advertisements, the US government used to fund anti-smoking campaigns. They spent 1% of what the industry spent on smoking campaigns. And you wonder why everybody smoked. Sure, there's some advertising telling you not smoke, but the vast majority of it is telling you to smoke. So obviously you're going to be like, all right, you're going to be persuaded in one direction. So it's about equalizing the conversation. It's not about self-aggrandizement. It's really just about trying to counter the negative attacks that happen to you every day. I resonate with that. One of the things that I've written previously is this whole idea of how do you find your strengths and basically doubling down on your strengths and that journey to becoming world-class and developing mastery at that. I think it's very important because as you said, when we're working and in our day-to-day -day lives, feedback is synonymous with things you've done wrong rather right. than things that uh, you did well and here's how you can further improve on it. And I think a huge part of my life and, and the journey of being a startup founder and the work that I'm doing now as a developer advocate in the, the database world is this idea of finding 
what is it that you're good at and approaching life from a position of strength and from a position of abundance rather than constantly trying to make up for things that you're not good enough at. And I love Mm -hmm. the fact that you view it as like a narrative correction mechanism where if the world is telling you all these things and everywhere you look, you don't have a six pack and you don't drive this car (laughs) and this and that. That's the nature of advertising by trying to uh, conjure up scarcity. It gets you to buy things that you don't actually need. But if you can view life from this lens of abundance of saying, hey, I'm doing this to actually correct that narrative and and having these practices like journaling and gratitude and stuff like that and daily affirmations. I love that you've actually put it in a different perspective than I've thought of it, where it's it's not just about taking you to the next level, but it's about actually correcting for all these messages that you unknowingly absorb. Because if if you spend five minutes on Instagram and see how you feel about yourself afterwards, like that's just, that's just a a case in point right there. Yeah. Thanks Mm -hmm. for that. Super interesting. I want to close the last couple of questions just about the stuff that you're reading and things that you enjoy. Are there any blogs or newsletters that you frequently enjoy that you'd like recommend to the listeners? Blogs or newsletters? I, I think done recently, I've actually stopped reading a lot of those because of how crazy life got <laughs> or how crazy the country got in the past uh, couple months. So most of what I read now, as far as blogs and newsletters, is just informational. So I guess less of that. You said blogs, newsletters... And the next question is going to be about podcasts. So we can podcasts. include podcasts in there. Yeah, I, I really like, I really like the knowledge project. I like free economics radio. I like, I could actually just pull up my phone and figure out, let me just go for it. Let's, that's the best way. Let's, yeah. let's see what Yao likes to listen to shows. Okay. That's interesting here. Oh, actually, I'm a huge fan of, yeah, maybe let me not say that out loud. <laughs> okay. um, I, I can explain it offline, but it'll sound weird if I just say it. Okay, cool. So I'm a huge fan of Jameel Hill's Unbothered. Yeah, and then just regular stuff. I listen to the Mark Maron podcast. I listen to the Daily Show podcast. That's mostly it. Mostly informational stuff. Then the, the last question I'm going to end with is, you've clearly grown a lot in the past, let's say five to 10 years. And you've learned so much from the startup endeavors, your time at Princeton, your time at Bubble. What piece of advice would you give to yourself 10 years ago? Other than the love yourself, it's okay to not be okay stuff, because I think I really could have used hearing that. I think I would have told myself it's not that deep. You know, I just, nothing is really that deep. Uh, For people who don't know what that means, it really, it means it's nothing matters as much as you think it does. I'm not like trying to push some existential framework on people. It's more just because we can only see life from our own perspective, the little things that happen to us feel so huge and important when to others, example, like they don't see it as big. And if you make a mistake, you might think it's catastrophic, but it might not actually mean that much. And if you choose to go to Princeton rather than Columbia or whatever school versus whatever school, like maybe you don't get into a certain company, but can you still build a life that's meaningful and rich? Yes. And I think the most concrete way I would tell to myself is when I was, how old was I? Yeah. When I was in high school, like early high school, I had the next 15 years of my life planned on a yearly basis. And I would just go tell myself like, Hey man, if it doesn't go like this, that's actually a good thing because there's a lot of unknown unknowns that you have. The world as you see it is all that you've happened to experience. As you experience more, you'll see things that you hadn't known before. Maybe you'll find that interesting. So instead of trying to like, based off your limited frame of how the world works, build a very specific rigid path, how about you just devote yourself to trying to explore as many things as possible, see the world, see what it has to offer, see what interests you, and then just pursue what you find interesting. I think that's what I would tell myself. I know that I wouldn't listen because I have these African parents to answer to, maybe some little trickle of it would have gotten in there and I would have done a year abroad before I started school. Because fun fact, that is my number one regret. (laughs) Dude, totally. I think that's wonderful advice. I suddenly Mm -hmm. resonate with that. I think that it's funny how most of our conversations have been about career and startup things, but a lot of the more human insights that you have, like I've discovered them in my own way in my life and surprised how much we have in common there. So that's one of the many reasons why I love doing this podcast, get to know more about my friends and discover things that we otherwise wouldn't have talked about. So I thank you so much for this really wide ranging, really insightful conversation. I really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. Uh, The last thing is where can people follow you online um, and where can people find uh, the work that you're doing? 
Yeah. If you Google my entire name, I'll come up, but it's long. So what I'll say is you can follow me on Twitter at YaoOB underscore. You can find me on LinkedIn if you type my whole name, Y-A-W-O-W-U-S-U dash B-O-A-H-E-N. My Instagram handle, I think is Fresh Prince Akeem. And where else? I don't really use Facebook. Oh, about my job. Okay. So if you... <laughs> If you go to if you go to bubble.io slash immerse, that's where you'll find everything about the program that I mentioned. Immerse Demo Day is coming up. If you go to the Immerse page, you'll learn about that as well. And I believe I have a personal website, uh, yawob.me. And that's gotta be it. That's funny. It I've never been asked, or i I have never been asked this question this directly, and I'm realizing as my, it should be my job to, I should have that memorized. So thank you for putting that. I'm going to go write that down. So that I, I'm glad to, yeah. <laughs> Cause you asked, I was like, crap, I actually have no idea what to say. So anyway. It's good. I'm, I'm glad you can get something out of this. You've given so much value. So at least next time you get asked that it'll be a, a simpler answer, but dude, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much. If you're listening and made it through the two and a half hours of our conversation, I'm so, I'm sure you've learned a lot. <laughs> And I look forward to having you on again in a, in a few months or sometime next year to, to chat about how the accelerator has been and stuff that you're working mm -hmm. on now. I'm sure there's more that we can talk about. There's some questions mm -hmm. that I didn't get into, but I'll save them for round two. But thank you so much again. It's really been a pleasure. Yeah, man. I'm really excited to chat because if there's one thing anyone should know about me, it's that my life looks dramatically different in six month periods. So can't wait for y'all to see the next iteration. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Learn with Aftar. I really do hope you've enjoyed it. If you've learned something from this episode, please subscribe on YouTube, review it with five stars on Apple Podcasts, or just tell your friends and family about this new interesting podcast you've discovered called Learn with Aftar. I want to show you one quick thing before you go. If those of you on YouTube be able to see it on the screen, if not audio, I'll describe it. You can go watch it on YouTube, uh, YouTube channel Aftar Sirathan. But I just wanted to show you something in case you're not aware of it. If I can find my share screen button. All right, what I wanted to show you was uh, this. It's called Aftar's Weekly Wisdom. And every week I write a newsletter where I share practical wisdom about self-mastery, startups and investing and business, as well as health and happiness. My guarantee is that you'll discover one thing that can change your life every week. The newsletter is called Aftar's Weekly Wisdom. You can check it out here. You can see I talk about topics, sharing the podcasts that I found most interesting, essays that I've written. You'll also get new podcasts that I, that I release. And you'll also find things like my essential reading list for 2021 and my favorite annual review questions. These are just some of the articles that I've released in the past couple of weeks. So uh, if you like it, go and check it out at uh, aftar.com. That's A-V-T-H-A-R.com. Put in your email address there and you'll start receiving new newsletter editions every Sunday. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope to see you on another episode of Learn with Aftar very soon.